All right. We will get started. So I'm going to officially open the meeting. I'll turn it over to board member Strauss. I'll um, open the state board study session. And um, we have two board members here representing the state board, member Rucker and myself, and we're glad to be with you today. All right, thank you. So why don't we begin with the flag salute? Araceli, will you lead us in the flag salute? Certainly. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, so before I begin, I need to note that we have the absence of a quorum at this point of the day. So we'll continue with our meeting agenda and we'll take the items in order, but um, in the absence of a quorum, we will not be able to take any formal action, but we'll proceed um, through our agenda because I know that feedback is, is very much needed. So um, before we proceed and I turn it over to Glenn for any announcements, just want to officially as we have our history of CPAG members in new positions after having been appointed to CPAG, officially congratulate Jorge Aguilar on his new position as superintendent of Sacramento City Schools. Congratulations. <laughs> So I'm going to turn it over to Glenn. Well, thank you, Chair Skin. I just obviously want to echo the congratulations to Dr. Aguilar. I know your leadership for Sac City is going to be awesome, and our expectations are high, and we know that you're, 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 you're going to exceed them mightily. I um, also wanted to take a moment to thank um, all of the staff who got involved in preparing for today. You know, sometimes I know a lot of people involved in organizing meetings around this side of the dais, and you know that behind these kinds of sessions is a, a lot of work and a lot of detail and particularly want to thank Patty Ramirez, Kevin Donnelly, Catherine Rogers and and Nicole LaPont and everybody from our technology services division who's labored mightily to make all this work come together. It's really, really appreciated. And speaking of, of heavy lifting, I want to express a big thanks on behalf of Superintendent Torrelson to our co-chairs, Joanne Iskin and uh, Ed Monansala, who unfortunately couldn't be with us today, but know that there's a lot of work that they put in in between meetings, getting ready, uh, consulting on the agenda, looking at what, what's coming up. and. I think someday when, when we establish the local control funding formula Hall of Fame, um, you, you guys are going to be first round inductees, um, but your, your, your work is really appreciated. And uh, we're looking forward to a fantastic day today with a lot of great items. So um, let's get going. All right, so why don't we move right to item one. Good morning, California Practitioners Group, members of the State Board. My name's Melanie Sheppy. I'm so excited to be here with you today. One, because it's June 1st, and I always like the start of a new month. It just kind of feels, it's like, all right, if I didn't do it last month, I bet I can get it done this month. So I'm excited to be here with you on this wonderful June 1st. Again, my name is Melanie Sheppy. I'm the Director of the Improvement and Accountability Division. And today we have a standalone item to talk about the statewide system of support. As you all know, with the passage of LCFF, the Local Control Funding Formula, and the formation of the LCAP, the Local Control Accountability Plan, and the California School Dashboard, we've been re-envisioning our accountability tools for California. And now we have the opportunity to re-envision our statewide system of support. For the next about 40 minutes, we are going to review the CPAG memo, which talks about the overall goals and desired outcomes for the statewide system of support. And then I'm going to ask you for feedback on support, resource alignment, and resource dissemination. 
When I thought about our discussion today, I thought about when I was a principal. So in my previous life, I was a teacher and principal in Oakland Unified from the Central Valley, coach teachers throughout California, but enough about me. Um, and when I started off as a new principal, I took my leadership team and we talked about some of the different pieces we were gonna use to work towards our goals for the year. We talked about assessments, we talked about standards, we talked about long-term plans, we talked about some of the different services some of our students would need to receive. And my leadership team was the one who reminded me to take a step back and talk about the system that would hold these pieces together from the school level. And that reminds me about the, and that, that experience comes to mind as we are embarking upon talking about California statewide system of support and specifically thinking about how LCFF provides the foundation for that system. So within the CPAG memo, you would have seen that we already know the system of support will have three levels. And of course, there'll be differentiation in those three levels. We already have key LCFF policy decisions that are the foundation of that system of support. Multiple measures of student success, resource decisions linked to data, and also the LEA, Local Educational Agency, as the primary focus for local accountability. And when you think of our system of support's goals and their characteristics, the goal is to help LEAs and schools improve their ability to meet the needs of all their students and focus on building equity, focus on equity and building local capacity to sustain that improvement. Three key characteristics of this system is to reduce redundancy across state and federal programs, integrate guidance and resources across state and federal programs, and then making sure that assistance supports districts through the LCAP process, that the system of support doesn't exist outside of the LCAP, and that they're really integrated as school communities are thinking about how they want to get better for kids. So those last two slides were really to summarize the CPAG memo and to talk about what's the foundation of our system of support, what are the desired goals and outcomes, and now I want to hear from you more specifically about what support looks like. So we know what support doesn't look like. It doesn't look like a local school, local district saying, this is what I need, and a support provider saying, well, not it. Try over there. I, I can't do that. It doesn't look like someone who's really looked at what their community desires and values, and then connecting with a support provider and them saying, well, Maybe I could do that, but really, I'm set up to provide this. Don't you want this? That doesn't work, and we know that. Some people can call that the wrong door theory. Nope, wrong door, try again. Or not it, not it, I can't do that for you. But if you really wanna do this, come on board. We know that doesn't work. So I wanna ask you, what does work? We know that local educators and stakeholders need to help define assistance. And you, as members of the California Practitioners Advisory Group, are one of the perfect places to ask what does support look like and help us inform how we want to continue solicit feedback as we continue to build out our system of support. So that's why I kept the question broad because I really want to hear your thoughts when we ask what does support look like and also what does capacity building look like. So I'll give you five minutes, turn in threes or partners, get cozy, and then we'll come back together and have a whole group discussion. All right, I'm gonna pull us back together. So share with me what you and your partner discussed. What does support look like? What does capacity building look like? And I wanna thank um, our two members over here for letting me eavesdrop and be part of their conversation. I appreciate it. Um, but as a group, let's talk about um, what you shared with your partner. For me, in terms of building capacity, you know, in addition to the pawn work, I also do consulting work, and my title currently as a consultant is capacity builder. Yes. And so, to <laughs> me, to me, what that looks like, it has to be grounded on 
on a framework or a foundation of research so that you're looking at various elements within uh, the person or a department or a, a body that, that that's looking to do or achieve something. And, and that research and that framework then are able to guide you in assessing what are the strengths and the weaknesses of that entity to carry out its duties. And then once you have that, then you're able to, um, to provide the right support in order to increase capacity. Otherwise, I think it, it's difficult to, um, I think in order to create the change, you need to be intentional, you need to be focused on your activity so that it's aligned to your plan and your philosophy so that you can actually create change and to see it, to know whether the capacity building worked or it didn't. So Glenn and I discussed, obviously bo both of those things support at each of the levels. So at the top level where everybody that applies to all of them is maybe having, you said, research-based strategies or, or things that districts, LEAs could choose from that best meets their needs. And as the level increases, so to the intensive intervention level, what will, you know, what would that look like? Obviously, it couldn't, doesn't necessarily have to be something that's on a list, but that you could come up with something that best works for your district. Maybe it didn't work somewhere else, but we could try something new. And as far as building capacity, we felt that the district or the LA would need to function without someone kind of looking over their shoulder or not a, a top-down approach, but working with that LEA so that they are equal partners and have an equal voice in, in what's happening in the within their LEA so that when that intensive support leaves, they're able to do it on their own. We talked over here, started by reflecting on what has worked and what hasn't worked in our experience. And what I've seen working most effectively are um, facilitated networks of people working on common issues of concern. And um, whether those are statewide or more regionally based, it allows people to be in a community with each other in an, in an effort to address a particular topic or area of focus knowing that there's a lot of capacity already existing in the group, but not complete capacity. And so that we, uh, that kind of network is supported by sometimes expert facilitators just to help us move forward in an appropriate way, but also with um, areas of expertise. Not everybody knows the research. Not everybody has a chance to, in, to talk and dialogue with the researcher or somebody who's got deep experience and deep um, background in a particular area. And um, over the years, the districts that I've worked in have benefited more from that kind of an approach that really kind of honors both the expertise that we locally have as well as what we don't have, recognizes that, and pairs it up with expertise from other outside providers, but also recognizing that they don't have the inside level of knowledge about how districts work. And so that kind of a partnership and making it ongoing, multiple year, and to the extent practical, um, doing it in a way that allows for continuous, sometimes even informal, um, continual networking beyond, say, a period of, you know, say, two or three years, so that if people are, are located in a general regional area, they can continue a lot of that dialogue or, or actually face-to-face -face meetings as needed. So I think we're definitely kind of in the beginning here needing capacity building on the whole process of continuous improvement and using data, using root cause analysis, that kind of thing. Um, you know, before we get to more specific kinds of support about best practices or looking at kind of content, you know, is it something, you know, maybe your problems with English learners, but until you understand how to do that process of continuous improvement, you may not really understand the problem you have and what kind of solution you ought to be looking for. So if, you're, if we just come in with a bunch of solutions and a bunch of symptoms, we may or may, it's kind of a little bit more hit or miss. And if we can build that capacity for how to plan, how to understand problems, how to get down to the bottom, how to reflect on whether our implementation and our choice of a solution was good, and then learn from that. And, and I, 
I agree the the doing that in in groups that exist at districts forever and ever and ever and ever they're not one time task force or whatever they're just ongoing with practitioners who are you know closest to the problem when we have that everything will be wonderful and we will solve all our problems I can share for us a little bit, Joanne. I think we, we talked about many of the ideas we've um, heard around the table today. I think the one couple things I would add, um, one are the ability to connect with other districts that may um, have figured something out that you're also trying to figure out, say making progress with your English learners um, and be only see, you know, see who that is and, and uh, maybe the role of the state or the county um, or the collaborative to facilitate those connections through networks. Um, and also uh, more support for labor management collaboration. I think we have a lot of great models of that in the state and uh, lifting up those models and helping people uh, to connect with, um, with that as well. So to continue our discussion, it was the advantage of the statewide view of, of being able to connect people that have similar issues but also to acknowledge that some of the issues are very context specific and have to do with some sort of deep structural issues that are at the root cause of, of, of what we're seeing in the dashboard, that it is beyond just a curriculum instruction issue, maybe the inability to recruit teachers, it may be some fiscal management issues. So how can you also provide a more granular and specific level of support on what some districts are perceiving as obstacles that are really precluding them from getting to significant solutions. Any other thoughts before we move on to our next question? I appreciate each group shared similar things, but also touched upon different aspects of it, connecting it to the three levels of support, talking about the type of problems that are out there, the different ways to connect, Connection can't just be for a few years. It has to be a part of how we're doing business and how we're working together. So I appreciate. And any other comments? Uh -huh. um, yeah, only because um, I appreciated the um, focus on equity comment, um, and I think that um, we shouldn't take for granted that um, because it's a very popular term at the moment, um, that um, the state should consider um, defining. Um, what equity is um, and how we should be expected to perceive equity and the lens uh, with which we need to see data. Um, only because I think that equity is oftentimes, confu is, is often, oftentimes confused with equality. And, and, and I think sometimes, well, not sometimes, in, in, on many occasions, um, we know that it's not an equality issue, but we use equity to, to disguise um, what we're really looking for, which is sometimes access to equal resources, um, and we frame it as an equity issue. Um, and, and, and I think that, um, that the dashboard um, won't go very far if, if, if we allow our, our schools and our districts to use equality um, uh, to disguise um, equity. Thank you. Piggyback off what Joanne said, so districts are very unique or can have very unique features that they may not be able to see are actually at the root of other problems. So if there are facilitators who come in not to find the problem for you, but to help you or, you know, just ask the right questions until you are self-reflective enough to find the answers, I mean, it's... I think that's what we were kind of saying. Don't come in and write a plan for us. Come in and just keep kind of needling us until we figure out what we need to do. We're going to continue talking about the statewide system of support, but get a little bit more specific. So in the memo, it talks about there has to be a link between school, district, county, regional, and state resources. So my question is, in your opinion, how should we effectively link those resources and support? And we, it came you know, a little bit from our last conversation, 
Um, but so this time I'll just give you three minutes since you've already kind of started with your partner, but how should we effectively link resources and support? And then we'll come back together and I'll hear your thoughts. Okay, we're gonna come back together. What did you and your partner talk about in the light of effectively linking resources and support? One of the things we talked about is thinking about different kind of roles. And uh, for, you know, just kind of off the top of our head, we talked about people or um, parts of the system that help our conveners. So a county office or the state can help convene meetings when people can talk about issues or begin to address issues. Another role is being a purveyor, having information that you want to share. And um, in this case, county or state or individual districts might have information um, that other districts don't have. And so they might be purveyors of information. Uh, another role might be being an intervener. And that may be something that is needed at one level. I think we have to be very mindful that, of it not being just a top-down kind of a system where the state provides, intervenes to the county, the county intervenes to districts without kind of mutual agreement about how that intervention is going to look like and who's going to be involved with it. Um, so conveners, purveyors, interveners, facilitators, um, and how we look at those different roles across and you know, Mariana, when she talked about the different levels of intervention, I think that's really important to keep in mind. I tend to go straight to the, the one that, you know, I put myself in a situation, what if I need all the help I can get? <laughs> <laughs> I want all the resources. Um, but I want them as resources, um, not as mandates. I'll just chime in with one comment. Um, you know, in talking about uh, the discussion just a couple minutes ago and uh, networks and capacity building, um, this question makes me think of the importance of stability and um, for teachers, for principals, uh, for district leaders, for superintendents, um, because you know, if we're successful in building capacity and then people leave and they're no longer part of the network and the network dissipates and um, you know that multi-year connection and ability to solve problems together goes away. So part of um, linking resources is linking resources over time and policies that promote that stability um, intentionally, I think, can help with that. Assuming we're going to have to use technology because this is a big state, and so that's one way to share. But I, I do think there is, I mean, when we talk about the networks, a lot of that is in kind of the relationships and the, you know, putting people in the same room to, to talk and have ideas. And I guess the question is, you know, what level does that happen at? And so it, it could be. I just know that as a district, sometimes you end up very isolated. You, you might have the best intentions of convening with other districts, meeting other people, but finding the time and, and making sure that you do it on a regular basis is difficult. So the, I think that's why it's easier to just go to one county or, you know, to go to the state. So you end up, it's a very, you know, one 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 to one relationship. So I, maybe the answer is, is, how do we make it easier to have those kind of at this peer relationships? Does this do the state and the county support, and does that mean funding or making it easier for those peer to peer to happen more often on a more regular basis so they don't always kind of fall to the bottom of the list? Thank you. Any other thoughts? If I shared all the things that I was thinking as I listened to what you said, I'd need another hour for the item, and I don't think I have that. So I'll just, I'll just want to tell you, I, everything you're, you're sharing, um, I'm making a lot of different connections to, and we're, we're going to take all your feedback. So I just appreciate it. It makes me want to get coffee with each of you and be like, so you, I had this one time where I was in a network, and then it just fell apart. Why is that? So 
I just want to thank you for all of your uh, great comments. We have one last question, and this one goes a little bit more specific when you're thinking about the system of support. And this is along those lines of resources. And specifically, we can think about all the different ways that we try to cull resources. Um, and I want to ask you, how do you ensure the right resources get in the hands of those who need them at the right time? So take, let me see my time, take about three minutes again to chat with a partner, and then this will be a conversation we'll close out with, and I'll talk about next steps coming. And this time I'm going in the middle. Okay, I'm going to pull everyone back together. What did you and your partner talk about? So I saw this question and, and I realize it's actually two questions. Mm. So the question of what are the right resources and when is the right time? And earlier we in our partner discussion had talked about the vetting of the resources and, and who does the vetting. So kind of taking a, a step back, who does the vetting? And then the issue of the right time, I don't feel that let's just say if you needed that targeted intervention that you wouldn't know what resources were available until you needed them, that everyone should know from the beginning, these are your options so that it doesn't come as a surprise. So we decided that we need an app. So, oh, so all right, I'm going to write that down. <laughs> <laughs> something that's app-like that says, oh, here's your district's dashboard and your demographics and maybe your finances, whatever, whatever everybody knows about us already and says, here is our very, it's personalized, but it's not really, really personalized, but just here's what it looks like some of your issues might be and here are links to information, resources, something that comes to us and, and maybe highlights things that we didn't know existed or didn't know were out there. You know, maybe this will all be in the model practices, but there might be a level, and I know Barbara wants to write some more apps. She looks so excited. Um, but just something that maybe comes to districts that's not asked for, because sometimes it's, it's the asking for that doesn't happen. And, and so something that pushes out to us, even if it is a little high level, and maybe wide, we still could find, we could say, oh, those three things we already know about, but these two, that's brand new to us, and this is fantastic. I, I think, um, I, I'm a little jealous. I think there are a lot of resources out there that I don't have access to, that I want access to. For example, um, if you're a very large urban district, you have access to Michael Fullen. If you're a very large urban district, you have access to some other, you know, fantastic researchers out there. and At the state level, state has access to Kenji Hakuda. I'd like to have access to Kenji Hakuda. So one of the things I'd love to see our state do is figure out how we can provide increased access to some of the resources that we already know are really outstanding and, and very supportive of the work that needs to happen here in our in our state. Um, and it, it really can't be just reading a paper, because I, I can read a paper, but what I what I think is missing is the chance to dialogue and to engage in conversation, to share kind of what the, the experience is in the district, to learn from other districts, but to do it with that person or those, those um, districts that are doing an excellent job. That, I think, is the part that, you know, there, there's information out there. It's just not collected in a way and, and it's not easily accessible to other districts. So I think right resources is an interesting concept because there are lots of things available, but how do I know that it's the right one for me and what indicators should I expect to see if I actually use this resource to know it is the right one for me? Uh, we talked about, um, you know, is there a way to identify some benefit even though it's small so that a district would know that having made this choice and now seeing this benefit that this is the right resource and they should continue to pursue the use. So I guess I, I want to focus on that right resource concept. Any other thoughts? 
I think for me, it's about identifying your your local, the people. Um, usually, when I work in schools, and I, if I want something done, you're able to identify who's the go-to person that's going to make it happen, or that knows where all the resources are at. And if there would be, and usually it's word of mouth, which is difficult, right? Because you have to ask around. But if there would be a way to formalize that, or those people or those positions that have specific expertise that they already, that is acknowledged within their local context, I think it would be beneficial. Because in talking to different principals about resolving different problems, part of what was shared with me is that they don't necessarily at may call upon the local district until it gets to a certain level because they don't want to attract attention that they're struggling. They want to make it seem like everything's working fine. And so they resort to mentors or other principals, you know, within their colleagues, the ones that they trust and, and that. And that's their, their first recourse when it comes to solving problems. So maybe, you know, making sure everybody has a buddy would help. But also, again, formalizing some of those networks that already exist. Araceli brings up a wonderful point about people having to feel that it's okay to say that they have a problem and that it's not a failure to seek help. And I think, I mean, that's part of the whole mindset and culture we're trying to change from a try not to be noticed and certainly don't get a label of being in program improvements, but instead a culture of everyone can be better all the time. So the more you're asking for help, the better you are. I don't know, that would that might be a stretch for people, but somehow to, it, it needs to be a, almost a paradigm shift and it's okay to ask for help. Well, I wanna appreciate all the feedback that you shared today. Um, just wanted to close with some of the next steps. So where are we going with this conversation? Because as you all talked, there were a lot of other great questions that came up that we wanna engage with. So specifically, next steps include a June um, state board memo that will build upon the CPAG memo. Then there'll be a July item about the state system of support. And of course, the CPAG meeting will then follow up. So what I'm also hoping to do is collect the other questions that I heard you ask and make sure those are a part of the conversation in our next meeting. If you have others that come to mind, feel free to let me or my staff know and I can, I can build those in. But I hope that we can see this conversation as a progression. We started really high level with three very broad questions and then we can continue this discussion as we get more clear and more clear along the lines of the different needs that you all are surfacing that we need to discuss and think about. Um, one other note about next step is when you, the next item, next item? With Barb on the SSA plan, you also are going to talk about aspects of the statewide system of support. So specifically in the SSA plan, it talks about school support. So just know the connection between the conversation we had here is about California's statewide system of support in general. And we want to keep getting more and more granular and more clear. When you're looking at the SSA plan, we're talking very high level about some of the different school level support and know that the goal is to make sure that they are merged. And that's why the state level plan is more high level because we need to have this conversation about California statewide system of support as a standalone item. Um, so just wanted to give that context. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate all your time and feedback. Board member Rucker. Okay, so what I got from this conversation that you all just had is that the state is going to engage in continuous improvement on developing the system of support for continuous improvement for the LEAs. I think a lot of the, the part of the conversation that is grounded in some part of what the, I anticipate will be the state board's action is also to look at the work that 
Glenn Price is leading concerning developing the statements of model practices and giving the guidance on how to implement that. And so I'm hoping as your conversation continues, and this is a study session with the board, that there is some time taken to look at that work that's still very much under development because that's going to inform some of the conversations and some of the very broad uh, conversation you had today at a high level. My concern is, you know, as I look at the new superintendent in Sac City, he's taking on uh, the leadership in a district where there are clearly schools that are doing quite well, and there are clearly schools that are not. So for me, my question, as I listened to him and I looked at this conversation, my question was reframed to what kind of guidance is this conversation today giving to him as a new superintendent on looking at each of these issues, on looking at not just what the system of feedback looks like, but what it really means to do capacity building. Because clearly there are some schools that have answered the capacity questions if they're doing well. But there are schools in that same district that are having issues with capacity. So how does the work that's being done to create this statewide system of support going to give superintendents like the good doctor here, support and guidance on helping to answer the real capacity questions and doing the drill down on developing capacity and support at the school sites where it's not working. How do you benefit from a statewide system for to develop a plan that is crafted at the district level, but really has to drill down to how that is going to be implemented at school sites where the system clearly is not functioning as it should. So I think that the conversation about the statewide system of support goes back to what I heard him say earlier. It's not about providing equality and access to resources. It's understanding what is the equity of the distribution of those resources because it's only in equity that you will address whether or not the schools are making gains or showing improvement. If the conversation on support only drills down to whether or not you're making gains, but you're not creating the norms that will sustain those gains, I think that we will still lose this conversation through a type of salutary neglect that has characterized our previous system of accountability and support. So I hope as this conversation moves from this high level that we had today, it can inform some of the discussions the board needs to have to look at that drilling down. Thank you, board member Rucker. And to me, the, the question then becomes, and I think that was in the memo, you know, how do you define, what are the measures of success of the support system? And traditionally, those have always been gains in student scores of some kind. But do you really have to look at some changes in the system and the structures of the system so that you know that you are really shifting and building capacity so that things will be different in the future than they have been? We know we can do a lot of things in the short term to get student gains, but has the system really changed? Thank you. All right, I think we're, we are ready to, I'm sorry, public comment. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Yes, we have one public comment from Liz Guillen. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, I, because I have a shorter time to comment on all the questions you were asked, I'll go really quickly. Um, LEA should be provided tools that go, that are clear about what their goals are. So for example, the dashboard should say, this is your goal. Um, it should prompt questions and investigations that go beyond the colors. Um, I am hearing that if I'm in yellow, I'm okay. Um, that's not acceptable. Um, support uh, should be uh, 
mindful or composed or made up by people with experience and expertise in the student groups that need support. Um, expertise with moving English learners to success, special ed students to success, low income students that are um, <clears throat> struggling with other challenges um, to success. There were categoricals folded into LCFF like the economic impact aid that specifically required that resources be used to support the engagement of the community. We know that that is, even though it's an, uh, um, a state priority and there are requirements for engagement, the engagement still needs to be uh, higher. It needs to be greater. Um, and there need to be resources for that. We're at the point where LEAs are saying, well, we don't have resources for that now. We're only doing the minimum. Support for LEAs. Sorry, that was my last point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any additional public comment? No. Thank you. That's it. All right, now we'll move to item two, which I know is the heart of our agenda today. Good morning, everyone. Give me a moment to locate my deck. All right. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here today. My name is Barbara Murchison. Oh, look at this. Getting some technical assistance of my own. Technical assistance and support. All right, there we are. Good morning, I'm Barbara Murchison, as a state lead here at the department, and very pleased to be here with you today to take a look at that draft as a state plan that we've all been eagerly anticipating since we first met back in April of 2016. It's finally here. I'm thrilled to have some time with you today to talk about that and get your feedback. I'm very pleased to present to you a timeline that does not have an asterisk. I was really wary, really wary of not putting the asterisk. I had a couple of versions of this slide, but I was like, what would I say? How much room do we have to wiggle at this point? But just so you know what's happening with as a state plan, we presented the draft to the board on May 10th. Um, received some feedback around some modifications to make to the draft before putting it out for the public comment period. And we are currently in the 30-day public comment period. That began on May 22nd. I know you all are as a list of sub subscribers, so you are aware of all of the many events that are happening and all of the resources that are available to folks to help them engage with the ESSA state plan and help um, them engage their communities with the ESSA state plan. Um, there you are today in that June 1st, 2017 row. I'm very excited to have a good chunk of time today for you to provide feedback on the draft plan. Um, and at this time, we're planning to present to the board in July your feedback. We don't anticipate that the board will take action on that feedback at that time, but I think it'll be good to start before they get the wave of public comments to sort of hear what you as the official consultation body for state plan development um, have to say about the plan. So as we, as we um, look at the, the document today, I, I, would, I would ask that you provide as honest, actionable, specific feedback as you can because you know, your, your feedback is taken very seriously. Um, then in August, we'll be seeing you again and tentatively be asking you to provide feedback on the feedback, right? So we anticipate getting many data points from Californians, and we'll be asking you to take a look at that and make recommendations around the feedback for the board to look at, sort of do some of that pre-work so they don't have to look at all that feedback for the first time. We anticipate that the board will approve the ESSA state plan at its September meeting, and then just a couple days later, we will be submitting that plan to ED, September 18th. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the guiding principles because you've all seen them many times, 
but I think really important for us to just stay grounded in how this plan fits into the larger California education picture. Single coherent local, state, and federal accountability and continuous improvement system with ESSA playing a supportive role, not leading, not our leading dance partner, right? This is the supporting role. So just keeping that in mind, we're going to use our federal resources to support our LCFF-based system, not the other way around. So the plan really does, and, and you've, you've been partners in this journey for some time, the plan really does reflect the feedback from thousands of stakeholders around California, right? We've had, we're in the midst of our fourth phase of stakeholder engagement. Um, Lots of conversations around the state, thousands of folks weighing in on what they would like to see in this plan, sharing that input. Much of that has been incorporated into the draft plan. Certainly the state board has had a number of conversations around the creation of the plan. You all have had a number of conversations about what you would and wouldn't like to see in the plan. State board staff, very much a partner in the development of the draft document and dozens of department staff working in program offices around the building have worked to create the document we're going to be looking at today. Very important to, to note that this plan at the state board request has been written at a very high level. We had a good conversation at the March state board meeting around this really being an application for federal funds, a contract with the U.S. Department of Education, and um, a desire not to get too far into the weeds around exactly what California is going to be doing with that federal money because then ED can come and say, hey, we thought you said you were gonna do this, why aren't you doing this? So there's a real desire to keep this at a high level to afford maximum flexibility as we move forward building out things like the state system of support that, that Melanie was just talking about. So that's something to keep in mind and the plan is in the template that was provided by the U.S. Department of Education as you're reading it. Um, and I'm guessing you've all taken a good look at it already. Um, our responses are in those blue shaded text boxes so it's more clear like what's the prompt, what's this very technical formal template versus what's California's response. You'll also note there's an introduction to the plan. We will not be reviewing that introduction today. We built that out because the plan is a technical document written at a high level, but a typical stakeholder may not be really able to engage with such a high level technical document without additional contextual supports. So the introduction to the plan talks a lot about the California way, what it is we're trying to do here in California with the ESSA funds and resources, how that we're trying to align our planning, align our accountability systems, and align our systems of support. Lots of good background information there. We will not be submitting that to the U.S. Department of Education and will not be reviewing that today. I think you all are very well apprised of what it is we're trying to do here in California with our LCFF-based system. And there's also, um, at the beginning of each section of the plan, uh, a bit of italicized text that really talks about what is the purpose of this program. Again, most of us can say, oh, Title IV Part A, we know what that is, but for a typical person, like what is, what? <laughs> so it explains like what is the, the, the purpose of this program, about how much money does California receive, about how many kids are affected by this program, our schools are affected by this program. Just again, some context that helps people to approach this relatively technical document. That too, will be removed before we um, send this in to ED. But we think it provides you know, some good foundations for folks, makes the plan a little more approachable. As I mentioned, we have 11 plan sections. And those of you who have seen the toolkit know that we've broken up this 80 some odd page document into again, more approachable, um, accessible sections. We will be looking at all 10 of these sections today. We're not gonna look at the, the introduction, but we will be looking at all of the rest of the sections and getting your feedback. And this is the question that we put out for public comment and for folks who are going to engage with 
the public comment survey, they will see this question 10 times, right? For each of the section, we're asking people to share their ideas about how the section could be improved to promote equity and support students and schools. So it's a very broad question. We, we, again, we're hoping that this makes the engagement a little more accessible to a typical parent or community member or teacher or someone who's not necessarily steeped in education policy. But for our purposes today, you all have a, a, a lot more kind of technical ed policy expertise. Please feel free as you're being asked this question to get a lot more specific. We're hoping that this allows people to engage wherever they are. But for you all, we're hoping you will give us some specific feedback, as much detail as you can. So we've got an activity today. It provides a lot of movement. You may have noticed we've got big screens all over the room, we've got a team of facilitators, a team of recorders, and our goal by the time this item is done is to get feedback from each of you on each of the 10 sections. So I hope you did some pre-reading before you came here today, although I have strategies for that too. We're going to do two rounds. We have five stations. Each station will have one section of the plan waiting for you. We're going to start this morning before lunch with some of the shorter sections, okay. just so we can get warmed up. All right, we'll have about 15 minutes at each station. You can choose whatever station you want. You can see here um, we thought we would have three to four people at a station, but we have a few fewer people than we anticipated. So for today, we're going to have one to two people at a station who will be getting lots of technical and assistance and support. You will each have your own facilitator and your own recorder. So I hope you feel well cared for. Because we care, we care about you. We want you to have what you need, all right? So you can go to whichever station you like, but no more than two people per station or else there'll be a recorder and a facilitator sitting really lonely someplace, right? We want to make sure that everybody has somebody at a station. And we'll just move through and spend about 15 minutes at each station. And again, the question will be, how can we improve this section of the plan to better promote equity? Certainly our LCFF-based system is grounded in equity. We heard from board members at the May meeting that the plan did not necessarily reflect California's deep commitment to equity, right? So we're asking you and stakeholders across the state how can we strengthen the plan to make sure that it reflects the equity that is in our state system? And also, how can we strengthen the plan to better um, serve students in schools, like keeping the kids in mind, right? So that's the big question. But you know, with the help of your facilitator and recorder, you can approach that however you see fit for each section. Then after we've had a chance to rotate through each of the sections, our facilitators will report out just briefly, here's, here's what we, we talked about for each one of these programs. And then we'll have a lunch break. And part of my strategy, the accountability section, as you've seen, is, is pretty thick. If you would like to preview the accountability section again, assuming you've all spent a lot of time with each section already, if you'd like to preview it again while you're eating lunch, that will be one of the stations this afternoon. All right, we'll basically re we'll do another round with five new plan sections and then do the sharing out and move on to our next item. Are there any questions about how we are approaching this today? Is everyone as excited as I am to have this conversation? I'm super, I've been waiting for this since last April. I know you have too, yes. So this isn't a question about our activity, but it, it back to what you said about the conversation at the state board meeting about some groups wanting more specificity or more information about how certain things are going to be done. So I guess kind of there's a reaction saying, where can we as citizens of California turn to a plan that California has written as a state saying, here's what we want to do for education. Here are our, our goals for the state of California. Here's what we think is important. So I'm looking for the state's LCAP. 
So I understand the tension with not wanting to put too much into a plan that we give to the feds that they could turn around and say, hey, what about this, right. this, and this? But on the other hand, where is that document that the state is saying, here, you know, here's what we believe in, here's what we want to do, here's what we plan to do that everyone else can look at? We're hopeful. I mean, we don't have, um, well, I won't get into the size of LCAPs. We don't have anything quite as built out as a well-developed LCAP, but we think that the introduction to the plan, which we will not be discussing today because that's not going to ED and there's just not enough time in the world, um, does serve as a bit of that context setting about here's what we're trying to do, right? Here are our goals. Here's how we're setting about doing the goals. It's a beginning of that conversation, but certainly, you know, that's something that I think has come up before, and that's something that we may look at, like where is the one-stop shop for what it is we're trying to accomplish as a state? That is not the application that we're sending to ED on September 18th. That will not be the one-stop shop. Thank you for that question, though. Can you um, briefly share the feedback that the State Board of Education received at the May meeting? The feedback that they received or the feedback that they provided? Well, uh, actually, it was, a long, it was four hours long. <laughs> so in a concise format, <laughs> um, a little of each would be great. Sure, that'd be great. So, um, Member Rocker and I will just give you some highlights of what we're looking to build out and, um, and get your feedback on, is that the feeling was that it was too global, um, that we clearly have um, achievement gaps, and so there was a lot of discussion about what our expectation is. Um, should we be setting goals and targets? How are we going to be looking at strategies to narrow the achievement gap, which is what we've all been talking about. And so it was a general discussion about what specifics, again, with the balance of what Barbara's talking about, which is leaving it at a higher level to go to the feds, but at the same time knowing that we need to put more detail in to address those. Uh, and uh, Member Rucker, do you want to build on that? And uh, again, recognizing the tension that the board feels about contracting with the federal government about what not only what our state's accountability plan is, but what is the state's plan for improving schools and improving education in California. The question is not whether or not we're balancing how much money we're receiving from the feds with how much we want to uh, guarantee we will do with the money. It was more to look at and try to understand what is it that needs to be stated so that this is a document that meets the requirements laid out by the secretary to simply implement the law? And so that's the reason why you hear this conversation about, or the statement from the staff, that the plan is intended to speak at a high level. But the problem is that the, we have stakeholders in the state who are looking for this document to make some very explicit statements concerning schooling in California. And so that's where the conversation short, sort of turned, not only for the stakeholders who travel to give feedback to the board, but also for the board members. And so um, there's a lot of documents that have been published by the state of California concerning schooling in California by this particular superintendent about accountability, about teacher quality, about professional development, about what it means to create and provide the conditions for improving schools. And so how do you incorporate some of those principles from those very excellent documents that were published with a great deal of fanfare that should not be ignored in this state plan, but at the same time balance the implementation requirements for the existing mandates in ESSA? So the staff were asked to give something more. While it's important to stay at a high level, there are clearly some statements that have to be made concerning equity. Because if the plan does not have a clear statement, a clear and compelling uh, social contract concerning what continuous improvement means in schools where public education is failing those students, then it doesn't exist. 
And so that's part of what the board actually charged the staff to do, was to make plain what the state is actually doing and how we are balancing the implementation of a state accountability system with the overlap of those federal mandates. While it's not clearly laid out yet, that was what the board asked in each of the sections of the plan to be made more plain. And I'm using the language made more plain so that it's explicit without having to drill down to details or levels of minutia that many on the board feel should not be written in the plan. But there do need to be some very clear statements that are quite explicit and satisfy concerns of many stakeholders. Um, thank you very much. And um, yeah, it is very helpful. And I, I actually was thinking in a former um, positions that I've had, I've had direct responsibility to make sure that our title programs uh, are meeting district needs, student needs, and also me uh, meeting all the requirements, the federal requirements. And um, we, would, we would look at the plan very, very intently to make sure that um, we didn't overlook something that we needed to be aware of to make sure, and sometimes when questions came up about you know, interpretation or should we do this or do that, we would turn to the plan for guidance. Um, sometimes to allow us to do something that we wanted to a little bit differently, sometimes to find out, you know, quick little slap on the hand, remember you better pay attention to this. But I, so I appreciate the feedback that the state board is giving because out in the districts in the fields, in the field basically, um, we don't have time to go back and reread all the different documents that are out there. We need enough guidance in here that we can feel assured that you know we're meeting the legal requirements, and that we're we're doing um, we're following the state's guidelines and expectations for how do we actually move forward with our students in a way that's responsible and um, and effective. So I think it, it you know it would be very helpful at the, at the district level too and the school level. So let me just add, and, and so I think it is a balance for us, and we know we're going to be putting more specifics in before the plan is finally submitted, and this is the first time it's gone out for public comment, so I think that input's important. But the, it is a balance because it is a contract with the federal government, and so we want to balance what we're doing at the state level, continuing on the path we've on, been on with the commitment to equity and narrowing the gap and trying to decide again what member record said about not getting so far down in the weeds, but having more specifics to really um, give a clear message. And, and I think helps, your clearly communicated good. need of that the state would outline how districts will meet the existing federal mandates that are enumerated in ESSA, I think the plan actually does a fair, fairly good job of laying that out for you in a way that um, for each section, if you simply took one section and read it in a vacuum, you would understand exactly what the federal mandate is as it relates to that section of ESSA and how California is going to assure that all LEAs are doing these things. I, I think you will find that very clearly laid out. When ESSA was signed into law, it was signed into law with a great, with many, many people editorializing about the flexibility that states would receive. What you're not going to see in the plan is California laying out how it will exercise all the multiple options down to the district LEA and site level to implement the flexibility that was in, that's created under ESSA because we believe that flexibility is being exercised with the implementation of the LCAP and there's no need to articulate some of the same requirements that are already being implemented by the state through state existing statute and existing practice with districts to do that. Um, people reflected on a lot of new opportunities for innovation that states would be able to have and implement and write into the plan. The template that's provided does not require or ask the state to talk about innovative or new practices that will be implemented as a result of creating the state plan. The other thing that many people talked about was the increased or heightened profile for the role of stakeholders. And so that was the purpose of the CPAG. That's the purpose of the work that's already becoming a norm on what's being done to write the LCAPs and to do that work. So again, that's an element of activity that California is already attempting to implement as a norm that there is not a need to articulate in this ESSA state plan because it's a part of existing state practices that we already have the flexibility 
under the statute to do so while people are looking for a lot of flowery language talking about innovation and capitalizing on flexibility you know it's to borrow a statement from glenn price we're not going to worship the plan is the california's plan is not going to worship at the altar of the every student succeeds act rather it's going to articulate very clearly what california's uh plan priorities are on implementing a federal mandate and to use those state funds in ways that leverage the work that's already going on so i think if that is more clear more clearly spelled out more clearly given the uh and more clearly laid out as a foundational element you will get the things that you're asking for for Thank the you. districts to understand. Thank you, and I, I really do appreciate the comments that I think you, you made earlier about making sure that it was very obvious and very evident that there's a focus on equity and on closing achievement gaps. All right. Are we feeling sufficiently ready to move into our group conversations? All right, so we've got one group that's going to be set up behind Glenn Price. All right, please share your final thought or complete sentence. All right, folks. I want to thank you. Just, just wa walking around the room looking at some of these inputs, really amazing. I love that you had specific feedback around how we could improve the plan, particularly through that equity lens. So you have now um, successfully accomplished the first round. We're not quite finished though, but I wanna to talk to you about our next steps in the next couple of minutes. I'd like our facilitators to have a couple of minutes to digest, think about what they just heard from all five groups of folks, and then prepare to give a share out at about noon. In the meanwhile, between now and noon, um, we have helpers that very quietly went and put your lunches up on the dais. So take a bathroom break, start with lunch. It's not gonna be a full 30 minutes, no working lunch, because in addition to your lunch at your spot on the dais, there is also the accountability section. It is our lengthiest section of the plan, and it has been changed per board direction since it was a board item. So some of you may not have seen the new accountability section of the plan. It's posted on our webpage as part of the toolkit, but I know some of you are looking at the original board item. So do take a minute. There's nothing been deleted from it, but some pieces have been added. So I want you to take a look at that, board, at that accountability section, start eating your lunch, and in about 10 minutes, I'll ask facilitators to share out some of the major themes that they heard this morning. Take a couple more minutes, and then we'll get back down onto the floor for round two. Any questions about what's happening next? All right, thank you. All right, if you would, um, while you're chewing and enjoying your lunch, uh, I do want each of the facilitators to give us just a quick share out of some of the things they heard. I think it's really important. Um, you all did such great contributions, but it, it's nice to hear what your colleagues are thinking about as well. So I'm gonna start over here with McKinney Vento. Quick themes, what was shared? Sure. Um, so we had Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program, McKinney Vento. Um, so a few things that came up were how do we, um, as a state, ensure that LEAs are providing evidence of for their requirements for tracking and providing services for homeless children and youth. Another thing that came up is how do we strike a healthy balance around providing enough flexibility in the plan, but also um, identifying the who, what, and when of how we're doing things. So throughout the plan, it says um, LEAs should or we will, um, but there are not specifications around things like timeline. Um, something else that came up was how do we put this in the context of 
building capacity around continuous improvement. Um, so specifically thinking about how we're supporting homeless children and youth, how do we, uh, how is the state going to support LEAs to um, possibly engage in continuous improvement processes around supporting homeless children and youth. And finally, how do we track homeless students so that we can truly provide access to homeless children and youth to services, supports, and educational programs? So taking a hard look at how are we tracking them annually, or is it just a one-time thing they're checking off the box? How do we make sure that we're updating where they are so that we can truly provide access to services? All right, now we're moving to a table that had three topics. It was those Title I, Part A, additional topics, school conditions, school transitions, access to educators. So we'll start with the first one, access to educators. And I think um, folks mentioned that we should include the California standards for the teaching profession, that that was something that wasn't here now. There was concern about the definition of out-of-field teachers, and people knew that will be a subject of conversation later, but it felt it needed to be strengthened. And I think there was an overall observation and kind of concern that the plan describes what the department will report, but doesn't describe what actions will be taken if LEAs have large gaps. How would those gaps be calculated? Would they trigger some prescribed services? So questions kind of similar, I think, to what you were describing. The school conditions section, people appreciated the alignment to the accountability system here in California, and also talked about a similar theme, that it implies that the LEAs will take action based on their data, but do we need to be more explicit about what the expectation is for LEAs? The section on school transitions, folks mentioned, and most of the folks who came through that were including pre-K, elementary, and it kind of jumped to 11th grade and career pathways, and we're missing a big piece about transition between elementary and middle and between middle and high school. And especially when we know many of our students who are at risk of dropping out are identified in middle school, we need to strengthen those transition pieces. And I think the other theme that was raised by several folks was the question of parent involvement. And given that parent involvement is in ESSA, does it have a place in the plan? And folks weren't sure where it went, um, but we didn't see it on the list of bullets, and so it was raised here, and then particularly raised as something that could be addressed with transitions because of the research on the importance of engaging families in those transitions. Thank you. All right, moving on to education of migratory children, Title I, Part C. All right, so, um, I think that in this section, there was a lot of detail. There was a lot of technical detail about identification of needs. It was very clear that these are processes that are actually currently in place. And so this section maybe had even more detail than some of the other sections. So I think that most of the members appreciated that. Uh, they, a few people did say, though, that more specificity on um, the program side of things. So when it, when it came to the section about measurable program objectives and outcomes, there's a lot in there about identification and about needs, but maybe a little bit more program objectives in that section. And then finally, um, there seemed to be a theme of preschool throughout the section, throughout all of the sections, which the members appreciated. But maybe even carrying that a little bit further with um, what, uh, like, uh, there's a lot of identification strategies, but maybe how is that different for preschool versus students who are already in school? So just sort of balancing that out a little bit and carrying that through a little bit more strongly. And then obviously there's other sections in the notes, but I think those were the common things across. Thank you. All right, school support and improvement. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, Joy and I went through the notes and distilled it down to three big picture pieces. Um, as Barb said, this part was about improving basic programs operated by LEAs, part of the Title I series. Um, this is directly linked to the accountability section we're about to talk about. So there were a lot of questions in each group about what exactly does the exit criteria look like. But we focused on does the framework for support laid out here and as it's connected to the statewide system of support uh, what does that look like? How, what are the reactions to, um, from each group? Overall, there were three big pieces that were given back to us. 
documenting roles and responsibilities for TA support providers. And each group, all the participants were sensitive to the fact, um, as Barb mentioned at the beginning of the day, about how much we want to put out now in this plan versus flesh out later with further discussion. Um, resource allocation, we had every single group discuss resource allocation, um, specifically in that section. What are the triggers for the elements of the resource allocation review? And how is that process monitored, both in terms of the actions that are taken as a result of the review and the processes within the resource review? So that sums it up. Next group. Thank you. And then we have our assessment folks. Jacqueline will report. Thank you, Barb. Uh, we had a very fruitful discussion, and I just want to thank the members for all their excellent feedback. Um, key in what they were talking about is this idea about equity in language assessments. Um, they appreciated that, you know, Spanish was identified as the most populous language, but that section sort of was taking the liberty or had an assumption in there that that was all that was going to be addressed. And if that's not the case, then please flesh it out so that we know what else is occurring. And then that ties into the second section where it was talking about stacked translations and glossaries and 10 other languages or 17 other languages. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean there are gonna be other assessments or is it just the introduction? And if that's just the introduction, then that's not really equitable. Now I speak Spanish, I get an introduction in Spanish, but a test in English. If that's not what is meant by that, it's not very clear in the writing. So kind of improving that. And then overall, I think um, this idea of just providing enough detail, fleshing it out, like for example, in the very last page, this came up repeatedly this idea of, well, if you were engaging stakeholders to um, get meaningful input on the need for assessments in other languages, um, what did that look like? Who was in the room? Um, was it just a room full of people who are native English speakers saying, yes, it's a good idea to have other languages? If that wasn't the case, I wouldn't be able to ascertain that by reading this section. So um, taking a look at that. All right, thanks to all of you. You can just bet sharing out really quite a lot of rich information shared this morning, and we very much appreciate it. What I'd really like us to do, and it's sort of not, well, it's sort of a working lunch, but it's not a really that hard working lunch, is take 10 minutes while you're eating to look at the new revised accountability system document. We have five more programs or five more sections of the plan we want you to look at this afternoon, but this one is pretty meaty. There have been some new things added to it per board direction. So take a few minutes while you're eating lunch to, to look at it so when you get to the accountability section, you'll be prepared to provide feedback in 15 minutes. All right, so thank you. We'll, we'll reconvene, get back down on the floor at about 12.25. All right, folks, we have, we have reached the end of an incredibly, productive <laughs> session. So <laughs> what I'd like to do is give our facilitators 47 seconds to gather their thoughts <laughs> and be ready to share out just the highlights of what they heard during this last round. Um, and to give them that 47 seconds, I'll ask all of you to move back up to the dais. Thank you so much for your feedback. This has been a lot of work. I appreciate your persistence.
All right, folks. I'm looking for a faci oh, facilitators are still looking. Look at them. We're, I love them. All right, which facilitator wants to go first? Oh, look at that. Judy is ready to provide a summary. Well, we'll let the group move. They're moving. <laughs> okay, we're in the final stretch. I apologize for standing up. I think the energy is a little low, so I needed to stand up for me. Um, yes. So for, uh, we did the Title II Supporting Effective Instruction, Title II Part A, um, and we went through, similar to my last feedback round, just the top three. Um, and I'm going to ask Joy to, to help me with this if I forget something. Um, essentially, there was a, a significant discussion about what we mean when we talk about supporting leaders. Do we have priorities around what instructional leadership looks like? Who's in charge of providing professional development for leaders? So almost every group had something um, related to that line of thinking. Second, there was discussion of um, how linking the equitable access section in here to where it pops up in other places in terms of collection of data and public reporting. That could be done through using anchors. That was one of the suggestions. But as just assuring that there is coherence when these pieces of information pop up in different places. And what was our third thing? Oh. In addition to document. OK, yes. Um, so and the last piece was about um, multiple groups mentioned bringing in CSTP and using capsule, not just in induction, but through um, a, having a, have a role to play in professional learning. And what we took from that as we compared across the different groups is what they're what we're looking for there is an external standard for what professional development looks like for these groups once they are in um, veteran positions and no longer in induction. Is that right? Okay, thank you. All right, accountability, you're up. Okay, um, so we talked about several different sections. One section that we talked about was the end size and um, the difference between the 15 end sizes of 15, 20, and 30. Um, the suggestion was to add maybe a little bit of detail or explanation, um, not just about the fact that research suggests an end size of 30, but maybe a few details about what that research is, as well as explaining the fact that um, that. Uh, ESSA requires that um, there be the same end size across all groups, but in California we have 15, a, sub, uh, a subgroup size of 15 for homeless and um, foster youth because that's, that's in ed code. So sort of distinguishing between those two and maybe adding a few more details so that somebody who isn't familiar could read through that section and understand it slightly better. Um, we did also talk about um, the charts and what the goals were. So the orange box around or the orange, yeah, the orange square around the green box, and that that's the goal. And we actually had some discussions about, um, like, long term, philosophically, uh, why have we chosen that? And then um, also going back a little bit to um, some of the statistical analysis around what that means for the percentage and the number of kids um, in the state. And is that something that is that aspirational or is that achievable or is that the right number? We talked about that a little bit. Um, we also talked about some of the additions within the document, which had to do with adding um, information that had previously been in the appendix um, under the interim um, data points. Um, and then finally, we did uh, spend a little bit of time talking about the identification of schools and what that looks like. And I think CPAG at the last meeting that they had talked about the three options. Um, there's one option described in this document, but um, really t um, taking another look maybe at what those three options were. And then finally, differentiating that California will identify um, schools once every three years as an ESSA standard versus um, maybe yearly um, identification of districts under LCAP and LCFF. And so how that's different and that there's tension between some of these items that are LCFF based and things that are ESSA based. Thank you. Moving on to Title I, Part D and Title V. 
Thanks, Barbara. Um, title one, Part D is neglected, delinquent, and at-risk youth. And we talked about transitions between correctional facilities and local programs. And I think one theme that sounds a little bit familiar from the previous group was that there were several comments about assumptions that the reader knows what's currently happening. There's sort of references to what's currently happening and that that needs to be elaborated enough so that people understand that. And there was also a point about the partnerships with community colleges and the chancellor's office and the Department of Corrections. On the one hand, it describes sort of what the status quo is, but it, the question that was raised is what are the outcomes that we're looking for? for? And an example was, for instance, MOUs to support those partnerships. And that theme of outcomes um, was similar in the section about program objectives and outcomes. What are the expectations for improvement? It describes monitoring and collecting data, but not the expectations for outcomes. And there were, was a particular point about the fact that ninth and 10th graders are currently not tested in our accountability system. And that is a key time when we need to be helping to assess progress for those students, especially students that have been in these programs. So that's a gap that we need to address. Related to Title V, rural and low-income school programs, again, I think people mentioned that and needs more elaboration so that the reader knows what's currently happening and the section here needs to be more specific to needs of students in these schools. Thank you, and Title IV A and B. Thank you. All right, Title IV A and B is student support and academic enrichment programs. Um, so our groups, the overarching theme, which I think is coming up across all the groups, is that um, this section of the plan and, and other sections are not uh, obviously tied to the California's new system of accountability and continuous improvement. So making sure that sections of the plan reference the dashboard, reference our new way of um, providing support to LEAs and um, you know our movement from compliance to a system of continuous improvement. Um, there was also discussion about a need for clarification, again, to that theme, Margaret, about um, what is the historical context? So what are the, what are the federal requirements now? What is California currently doing? Um, and what's changing? Um, and then there were questions about where is there room for innovation and sustainability, particularly related to the 21st century learning centers. Um, so thinking, getting clarity on what is our approach for um, making sure that there are systems in place for continuous improvement of those learning centers um, and that uh, we also provide opportunities for sustainability so that these centers aren't just happening, you know, for five years and then the grant goes away and then that um, continuous improvement is interrupted. Um, and then finally for part A, um, there is a, there seems to be a gap um, between the purpose that's outlined above, which is focused on um, access to a well-rounded ed education, improving school conditions, and improving the use of technology. Um, that is not clearly reflected in the description under one here. Um, and so fleshing that out more to show the connection to those three bullets. All right, in Title III. Thank you, Barb. And again, I just want to say how much uh, I appreciated being able to be a part of this process and to get such great feedback from the members. Um, I want to echo the comments about weaving this theme that um, this work is rooted in LCFF and the California way throughout the sections. But I did want to say that this particular section got a lot of um, praise around being very comprehensive. It's one of the sections that was really comprehensive. And this idea that it was speaking to not only supporting teachers, but parents as well, was something that should be woven throughout all the other sections as well. Um, in particular, there were some comments around section one about needing to flesh out details again about stakeholder engagement. And I think the underlying point there is that, is it really equitable if all voices weren't considered within the section that you're presenting here? Um, definitely under the section around support for LEAs, a question came up 
around this idea of what about the things that you talk about in Title I, the Title I Part A assessments? How come some of that support language isn't included in this section? Maybe it should be. Um, there was also a lot of questions around this idea of isn't there legislation right now pending around reclassification? And whether it gets passed or not, should there be a guidance statement that we put in here in Section 1? And then um, one thing that was huge was this idea that long-term English learners or LTELs were not mentioned uh, throughout this. And uh, part of reclassification, you know, that's a concern. There should be some language around that and speaking to that because LEAs are going to need support around this area. Something else that came up that I thought was interesting around the monitoring section was, you know, in the document it talks about technical assistance through the FPM process, but also through the emerging statewide system of support. So what are some other triggers that can um, trigger technical assistance? Um, for example, what if you have an LEA that has continuous uh, amount or large amounts of long-term English learners? Would that be a trigger for support? And then I just also wanted to point out that I left out in my previous summary that there was discussion around um, assessments, in particular the Spanish assessment being part of the dashboard. And I'll let um, member Kaminsky speak to that a little bit more if she would like to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the one of the questions um, that came up in my mind as I was reading through this, uh, there was a section, and I don't remember where it was right now, where it talked about um, input that's been received from a number of different groups, um, CPAG, as well as um, I've referenced a couple other uh, task force that the state had in previous years around assessments. And in those, I happen to have been on those assessment task force, and I know that the recommendation included the Spanish language assessment, so I was kind of surprised that it wasn't here. And then um, seeing the the uh, discussion about why it wasn't here referenced some uh, differences between learning English and learning, in this case, Spanish, but it would apply to any language, and that is there's always some grammatical um, changes and differences from language to language. Um, but those, those differences um, speak to unique properties of each language, but the overriding similarity is that whatever language you're learning, and what we care about in the state, if we think about our common core standards, the essence is can students read, can they write, can they think, can they draw conclusions, can they think critically, can they make connections between a piece of literature and an informational text, um, can they look for evidence you know, to answer a question, can they do those higher level skills. And granted, every language has some unique features that are different. Those are just features that are learned that are unique to those languages, but the overriding concern is what can we do with the language? How do we how do we use it in our reading and our writing, um, and obviously in our speaking too? And the concern I have is that we um, the state, you know, has in my district, for example, the, we, there's a huge interest in dual language. It's it's quadrupled in the last couple of years. And while we may create a test and, and um, through our own volition check to see how our kids are doing in Spanish. We as a state, if we've, if the voters have passed this proposition and said, you know, that's, a, you know, that's something that they, the voters agreed it's worthwhile having, as a state, we should be measuring the progress. We should have a way of holding those programs accountable, helping districts know if they're working, if they're not working, and not make it a kind of an optional activity, but as a state, it's something that I think we should be measuring because we want to have good outcomes for the kids um, and for the programs that we put in place, and additionally, it, it's helpful for um, for school districts, for teachers, to know if a child is strong in one and not so strong in the other. How are they progressing over time? What's happening with that development in in both languages? Of course, they all have. We want them to all be proficient in English. We absolutely want that. But there are um, stages in that development. If a child is an English learner, or if a child is an English only child, a parent. I was actually just talking to a parent of an English only child the other day at one of my schools, who. She has no concern that her child's not doing well in English, but she does. She wants to know how's my child doing in Spanish, and um, if we leave it up to every every unique you know, every district to come up with their own way of testing or 
have to access the test itself, and it's not part of an accountability system, we're missing an opportunity to understand what we're doing and to provide guidance to other people about what's working best, what's not working, so that we so that we've put in place really good, strong programs. And since it is, the English learner population is so large in this state and so underachieving, I, I don't think we should miss tools that will help us understand where we are and what we can do better. And as a parent with two daughters in dual immersion programs, I would definitely be very interested in again in those options to see if the investment of time is really given us the outcomes, so I, I definitely concur. Understanding the plan currently says that the Spanish language assessment is in development and that we're going to be taking a look at it once it's available to, to see about validity, reliability, and, and be reevaluating whether or not it would be incorporated into the accountability system once it is actually developed, but it is currently in develop. That's great. and and. Um, uh, one of the other parts that came up in some of the discussion was that there was the comment about the, there's science is listed there, and it, that's all that information is laid out for science, but the Spanish language actually isn't even identified there in the same way that the science is. So it looks as if it's um, there's some decision not to do it because it's not included in there. And then somebody else raised the question, well, what about math? Because um, although sometimes we think of math as um, not language-based, or other people think that uh, there was somebody within the group who had been a math teacher was saying, well, actually, it's another language. But... Um, um, there are plenty of instances where kids who are learning English as a second language may have great math skills in their native language, which we wouldn't know necessarily unless we actually have that test. So I would, I would think that would be another area to think about. All right. Well, thank you for your comments. And I do need to take a moment, and we may even clap. I'm usually not a clapper. But <laughs> I really want to thank you all for your hard work. I know that was a lot to read and a lot to talk about. And I really appreciate your persistence and tenacity. And also, thanks to the recorders and facilitators who, so thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to go over the contents of this slide. We're a little behind schedule, and I want to see if we can get caught up. But I do want to draw your attention to the last link on this page. Oh, Eileen, thank you. <laughs> so I just wanted to let the CPAG members know and the audience that um, while we heard the reports out of the main themes of each group, the detailed summary will be presented to State Board in July. So that comment, the comments and specifics, and um, I was talking to Glenn Price too about trying to group it, and I was talking to Barbara about how to help the board understand where the key themes are coming from, from your input and from the stakeholder input. So I just wanted to let you know that we as board members really appreciate the time and the thought, especially this week of graduation and the last weeks of school and what it took to be here, and that it really will, you are our advisory group um, for this work and it really matters. So we will be seeing the real, um, the full transcript of it to the board. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, just want to take a minute to draw your attention to the last link on this slide, which is our state plan toolkit. Um, we have all of your input and we will be presenting your input to the State Board as part of the ESSA July item, but anything that you can do when you return back to your communities to engage um, your community members in taking a look at the state plan, we do have a suite of resources available to help them also provide input on each one of the 10 sections of the plan. So thank you very much, and I will turn it back over to the Chair for public comment. I just want to acknowledge you, Barbara, and your team for the tremendous effort in pulling the ESSA plan together. It's, it's amazing to see this draft of the document, and we've, we've heard about it, we've seen the PowerPoint slides, but to actually see the draft of the document coming together, I, we all know how much work that takes. So kudos to you and congratulations for all of that work. So let me open up now to any public comment. Yes, we have three. So would you please um, come up, see Lolin Cruz Gonzalez, and then Sherry Reeves, and then Brian Rivas. Good afternoon, members of the CPEG. My name is Sheila Cruz Gonzalez. I am president of Californians Together, and I'm also a school board member. I'm here to, to urge the inclusion of the California Spanish assessment in the accountability system as been recommended by the advisory committees for AB 250, 
AB 484 and the ETS primary language stakeholder group. Specifically, we hope that the state will augment the design of the, the California Spanish assessment to include the same components as the ELA CASP, um, convene practitioners and experts to advise the development of the CSA parallel to the review process for the NGSS assessment, um, convene a separate committee of practitioners to advise on decisions about implementation, about who takes the assessment at what language level and what grade level, um, design, have the CSA be computer adaptive so that administration is consistent and doesn't require different orientation for each assessment, um, and finally submit the assessment for peer review now as opposed to later uh, later after the, the, the it's been developed. Um, I'd also like to share this um, native language assessment frequently asked questions from West Ed, which makes it clear that we as a state should make every effort to include native language assessments in, account, in the accountability system and that states are required to submit documentation of peer review of native language assessments for use in accountability. Um, finally, I want to add for my colleague Sherry Reeves who had to leave early um, who was here to, to speak on behalf of Californians Together Advancement Project and the Coalition for Quality Early Education that um, they rec that we recommend that preschool be explicitly ex uh, explicitly um, addressed in titles one two and three thank you and then can I leave this one One more speaker, Ms. Guillen. Hi, I'm Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. Um, I appreciate all the, uh, the discussion and work you did today. Um, and I hope that, oh, well, it will be really helpful uh, to have a record of, of your comments. Um, your role and experience as practitioners is what makes them so valuable. Um, the uh, Equity Coalition, the LCFF Equity Coalition, submitted some comments to the State Board of Ed at their last meeting. And one of our overarching themes was um, that we support the development of a single system. Um, at the same time, um, we feel that the, the minimalist approach in the ESSA plan really misses the opportunity for the state to show how it values equity um, in, its so, in its California way and how we are really going to um, move um, the responsible adults to closing achievement gaps. Um, some other uh, comments that we had, some equity goals were that for long-term goals and improvement, we need to make sure that interim or annual targets in the dashboard are designed in a way that it communicates and incentivizes expectations about performance gaps, how they should be closed. Uh, regarding meaningful differentiation and school identification, we think that schools need to be identified using a combination of state and local factors, and that those will have the greatest, um, or, or that those, the the schools that have the greatest need are the most likely to benefit from that assistance if other factors are used. We think that a student growth model needs to be implemented and that 11th grade assessments should be part of the system and academic and non-academic indicators in the decision making uh, can be used while you're still meeting the federal requirements for weighting. For educator equity, we are concerned that every student, including low-income students, English learners, and students of color, are served by effective teachers, and that the state has a system to monitor and support districts in improving access. This is even more critical now uh, with the teacher shortage that the state is experiencing and that is getting worse. Um, I'll skip to some others at the end here. for. Um, English learner progress, um, we think that the requirements from the ESSA statute need to include the indicators, progress reporting, and so forth. And we also are in support of the comments you heard earlier from Californians Together that the native language assessment should also be part of this. Um, thank you very much.
Thank you, Chair Eskin. I just wanted on behalf of uh, State Superintendent of uh, Public Instruction, Tom Torlakson, to also thank the CPAC members for the awesome feedback that you provided during our rotations and echo the comments of uh, Board Vice Chair uh, Strauss around how this will be utilized, so we're gonna be taken into consideration. And also thank all the speakers that came forward uh, for uh, the great input that we received today and, and gosh, just really want to thank the facilitation team and, and the recorders. But uh, to your comments, Chair Iskin, I think sometimes people in the, in, the, in the field, when they hear about the ESSA office at the California Department of Education, visualize like a floor or, you know, or like this, this team of people. And particularly when you see the content that's coming out, I mean, this, the toolkit by itself is accompanied by a video for each one of the sections. The, the ESSA office is the amazing Barbara Murchison and Joy Kessel, who are two of the, the uh, mightiest, highest performing colleagues that uh, I've had the opportunity to work with in my career, and I think California is just deeply indebted to their work, because we're gonna get there. Obviously, our plan is, is in progress, but we're gonna get to a plan that California is really proud of, and I think we're gonna, at that point, and as we go forward, gonna really be indebted to their work and moving us along. Uh, it's, it's been a long road since President Obama declared the Christmas miracle back in 2015, and, and, and we got ESSA, uh, and we've got a ways to go, but really wanna thank Barbara and Joy for all the work that's been involved in moving us along. Thanks, Glenn. Okay, CPAG members, we are small and mighty today, and we're slightly behind schedule, and I want to be respectful of flights so that we don't become yet smaller. So if we can spend the, over the next hour or so that we're together, if you just want to get up and take a break as needed, and we can move on with the agenda. Is that okay with everyone? All right. So let's move to item number three. Well, good afternoon, Chair Iskin, Chief Deputy Price, members of CPAG. Uh, my name is Brent Malakut. I'm the Director of the Professional Learning and Support Division. I'm joined today by Constantino Silva, who is the Administrator in the Educator Excellence Office. And um, Tom Adams sends his best as well. He is um, in Davis today um, uh, doing um, what he affectionately calls his second full-time job as a, as a school board member for Davis. So um, he, he would like to be here, and um, he is here in spirit. I just wanted to, wanted to call that out. What's that? He was here this morning, absolutely. Yep, I think he said hi to everybody. So we're going to be continuing the ESSA conversation today, um, but really starting to dig in to think about approaches to defining something new under ESSA, um, a term that, um, that uh, we didn't necessarily see coming, um, but is here, and it's the term of ineffective teacher, um, as, as ESSA statutes re requires us to, um, to consider. So we've got uh, an objective today, um, and I've got a second objective too to buy some back some time on the agenda. I realize that we were behind, and so we're going to do our best to buy back some of that time. But our key objective today is to think about um, what we what should and what should not, and it's important that we think about the should not part today. Be considered um, in a definition of ineffective teacher, and we're going to help frame that today um, as well. Um, earlier, we've already received some great feedback that I think will probably come up. Uh, there may be some repeats, which I think is important to recognize is just fine in this conversation. Um, but as, um, as, as folks were uh, talking about access to educators, both in the Title I section and in the Title II section, some important conversations came up around this that um, we've already captured in notes. We hope to go a little deeper uh, during this section as we consider this, uh, this definition of ineffective teacher. 
So this slide really kind of sets up how we're going to organize the next uh, little bit together. Um, we're gonna, Coast is actually going to take us through some background on ESSA requirements, taking a look at the statute and what's required as we start to think about um, the ineffective definition. We're gonna introduce a set of four core principles um, that we would like everybody to consider as we start to ask questions and, and get your feedback um, on this very important subject. We are going to, um, we're, we're going to uh, make a bit of a change in the end of the presentation. We had a grand plan of getting together in four groups, but based on uh, the number of members that are here today, we see an opportunity to maybe um, uh, save a little bit of time, but also be able to get that, that rich feedback that's been happening all day long. So um, the facilitated breakout groups and whole group debrief, um, we're gonna change that up a little bit, but we have, an, uh, we have a plan for how we would like to get your feedback on this. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Constantino and he is going to take us through some statute um, to help us get some background. Thank you, Brent. Good afternoon, everybody. Well, I think you are probably as familiar as we are with, with the statute uh, by this point, right? Uh, section 1111 G1B of ESSA requires that uh, the state ensure how low income and minority children will not be served or are not served at disproportionate rates by ineffective, out of field, and inexperienced teachers. So these three categories of teachers, this is what uh, we are required to collect data on. This is um, what drives this discussion, these three categories, and of course, in particular, the one, the ineffective uh, uh, teacher definition. Uh, the statute here in front of you, uh, the, the bold has been added for uh, emphasis, but it, it's not a part of the, uh, uh, of the statute. Um, so the, the statute specifies also that we must provide an assurance that we will make public any methods uh, or criteria used to measure teacher, principal, or other school leader effectiveness for the purposes of meet, meeting this requirement. And um, of course, ESSA also uh, um, identifies that nothing uh, uh, in this requirement shall be construed as requiring the state to develop or implement a teacher, principal, or other school leader evaluation uh, system. Uh, originally, uh, you probably recall this, the uh, accountability and state plan regulations from November 2016 included some guidance on this. Of course, those uh, have been repealed by Congress earlier this year. And so um, that leaves the states with, um, with some work. No definition is given for the term ineffective. And so um, that is the work that we have uh, ahead of us in the next few months. And today, uh, this afternoon, is um, a, a very important session in that regard. Uh, so equitable access. Uh, Dr. Aguilar, I appreciate your comment earlier this morning, of course, uh, when we're talking about uh, these three categories of teachers and uh, the distribution of these three categories of, of teachers. We want to ensure um, how we're going to identify and address disproportionalities. And so uh, Section 1112B2 requires the LEAs in their plans, um, soon to be known in our state as LCAP Addendum, um, to identify uh, also any disparities that result um, in low-income students and minority students being taught at higher rates than other students by these three categories of teachers. So uh, state level and uh, LEA level. So in the absence of uh, definition, what, um, what are we to do here in California? Um, we have uh, what you are also certainly very familiar with, the California way. Um, this provides um, a, guiding, a guiding light, a north star, if you will, in, in our approach. And uh, the California way uh, has been, as you know, came, was created through considerable uh, input and voice from educators, parents, advocates, and uh, the, the guiding principles, the guiding ideals are those of uh, a commitment to local control with guardrails, of course, to ensure equitable support and outcomes for all students. A uh, strong desire for an integrated, coherent system of accountability and support, and an interest in creating capacity that reflects con a continuous improvement mindset. And so um, that is 
um, what is guiding us. Uh, the, the quote here from a Blueprint 2.0, uh, California, the California way rests on the belief that educators want to excel, trust them to improve when given the proper support, and provides local schools and districts with the leeway and flexibility to deploy resources so, so they can improve. Finally, uh, the second part of um, the second half of the California way, the definition here, um, uh, highlights the state's commitment to ensuring that ELs, foster youth, and students of poverty are not, uh, I'm sorry, that are given the proper support. Um, that is what we believe, and it's enshrined in, in this quote from the California way. Um, so how will, um, how states, my apologies, uh, we are required to consult with, with uh, stakeholders. Um, ESSA section 1111A1A requires that we pr uh, carry out timely and meaningful consultation with a variety of stakeholder groups, and we are rightly here today uh, getting your feedback. And uh, in closing with the, this, this slide here, I just want to point out that um, teacher effectiveness is uh, typically defined for the purposes of evaluating performance of individuals, of individual teachers. What we are um, seeking to do, or what, the, what, what ESSA allows us to do, the, the um, requirement here is to define ineffective teacher for the purpose of assessing the performance of a system. How is a system addressing equitable access to excellent educators for all students? That is, that is what we seek to do through this process. And uh, the, the, the purpose, again, is here to identify system level, level patterns, but not uh, to track performance at the school level for any other reason. So uh, with that, I'll close and I'll turn it back over to Brent, who will uh, walk us uh, through the activities related to the uh, core principles. Thank you, Costa. Um, before we talked a little bit about a set of four um, guiding principles uh, to help us <clears throat> guide our way, um, to also help us frame some questions and to gather some important feedback from, from you all today. And um, those four principles are on the slide um, here today. Uh, so the first thing that we want to make sure that we uh, stay true to is this idea that we respect local collective bargaining agreements. Um, we are not interested in interrupting and acting as a divide um, between school districts and associations. Uh, that's, not, uh, that, that's not the productive kind of work that, that, that we expect will come from this. Um, and we want to be careful of that. Um, we want to facilitate cooperation between teachers and school leaders. Um, and again, thinking about that, that uh, from before, we want to foster positive relationships. We don't want to put up divides between school leaders and, and teachers. We want, we want to make sure that we're fostering po um, positive relationships. We want to avoid the mislabeling of people in schools. Um, the word ineffective, I still, I've, I've probably said it, 10,000 times now in conversation and thinking about how we were going to approach this, but I still, it's a word that is really strong. Um, and it's something that we, we wanna make sure that we avoid mislabeling. Um, and we wanna avoid mislabeling of people. We wanna avoid mislabeling of schools, of systems. We need to be really careful about this because of the, just the, the strength of a word like ineffective. <clears throat> And then finally, and maybe most importantly, we want to make sure that we're ensuring equity of teaching. Um, equity continues to come up um, in conversations with CPAG, with State Board, um, and with others across the state. And thinking back to that California Way slide from just a, a few minutes ago, we want to make sure that our students with the greatest needs have the resources and supports that they deserve um, to be able to succeed. And one of those resources and supports is access to excellent educators. Uh, it's really important that we consider um, this for our students with the greatest needs. So considering those four principles, um, we are going to move into um, what we're going to do a, a breakout, but we're going to do it a little differently than we had planned, like I said before. 
And I'd like to approach it like this. If we could have Tara, uh, the, Tara and Joanne will be the dividing line. And everybody on this side um, of the dais will be, um, will be a group and will be talking about specific questions. And then from Joanne this way, we'll be creating another group. Um, we're going to have a recorder, a facilitator there to help answer questions and guide um, as needed um, as we uh, uh, pose some questions to each of you. And so this first, and we're, we're looking again at the guiding principle, um, and this first guiding principle being uh, respecting local collective bargaining agreements. Um, and we have two questions here. So thinking about that core principle, what elements need to be present in an in ineffective teacher definition to respect local collective bargaining? Okay, what needs to be present? And then maybe just as important to thinking about what needs to be present, what elements should not be in the definition? We need to be thinking about that too as we're respecting local um, bargaining agreements. We need, to, we need to be considering both what should be in and what should be uh, not be considered. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the folks on this side of the room, you guys are going to consider uh, question one right now. You're going to discuss it using these two questions as a frame to start the conversation. But before we do that, I'm going to give a task for group two, which is going to be looking at question two. Um, and this is, again, uh, the guiding principle of facilitating cooperation between teachers and school leaders and school leadership. How could a definition of ineffective teacher facilitate cooperation? And then what are some ways that it would hinder cooperation between, between teachers and school leaders? And so we're going to bring up, we've got a, um, a, a, a record sheet that you'll be able to have all of these questions at once. And um, Judy's going to pass these out right now. Um, we're going to do two questions right now. And these two questions, you guys are going to be speaking about them simultaneously. We'll do a quick report out um, to the whole group on the discussion that you had. And then we'll go on to questions three and four, of which you will each take one of those as well. Um, do we have any questions on the process or anything that's leading up to this point? Yes. Thank you. I do have one question. And I understand that... Um, ESSA is using the terms ineffective, out of field, and inexperienced. But in our response, um, do we have um, any leeway to talk about most effective um, in field and um, most experienced teachers? Can we turn it to a positive? Because part of, the, part of the concern that I think we all feel is you know, nobody wants to be called an ineffective teacher. I don't want to call anybody that. And I'd rather, you know, you know, my thinking, I'd like to be thinking, how do I increase the number and the range and the distribution of the most effective teachers? So I don't know if that's a possibility or not, but I thought it might help with the concern of, of the way we put language in, and, and making sure that we're not violating contracts and things like that. I love that idea. I, I think it should be explored in the group. Um, we, we're using the word ineffective today because that's how it's called out in statute. But if that's something that your group feels strongly about, I would um, highly recommend to take that uh, conversation down a path, see where it leads, uh, because we've had similar conversations. And um, yes, I would encourage that. So in your conversation, did it lead anywhere good? <laughs> um, I would say it was more positive than ineffective. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> is there a definition for inexperience, or is there something that we're commonly just using when we're talking about that word? It's Currently, the definition that we're using is two years or less um, is the, uh, the definition for inexperienced. Um, not to say that we, we couldn't explore that again, uh, but we do want to focus the attention today on ineffective um, because, it, because it's new and it's because it, it, it's something that has not been reported on in California before. So we're hoping that we can focus this conversation today around ineffective. All right, so let's go ahead and group up. If we could have, again, um, these four discussing question one. Yeah, stay in this, stay up at the, um, so that we don't have to uh, take the time to move up and down again. And then, yeah, let's take about, um, 
five minutes? Yeah. Yeah. I think if we're going to buy back time, we're going to yeah, need to do sure. five minutes. And we'll gauge on time. Um, let's start with five or six minutes and we'll check in. Thank you for that. All right, if, if we could bring everybody back together, um, and I'd like to ask group one with question one, and we'll refresh on uh, respecting local collective bargaining agreements and what element, elements need to be present and what elements should not be in the definition. Um, somebody from question one willing to share out? Um, you took all our notes. <laughs> right. I can give them back to you. <laughs> um, we had a wide-ranging conversation about um, different uh, ways to measure effectiveness and different things that correlate with effectiveness. Um, I guess one of the things we talked about was um, the importance of uh, of, of having fully certified teachers, and that's uh, priority one under LCFF, and it's not currently uh, reported, and it's something we see wide disparities in, in actual teacher qualifications, um, and we're seeing that those disparities widen during this time of teacher shortages, so lifting up just the need to return to some very basic measures um, and report those and lift them up fully in our accountability system under both LCFF and ESSA. Um, we talked about, um, we felt a little constrained by this, by this question um, and uh, wanted to uh, lift up maybe what are other statewide data um, elements that we might look at that, that get to effectiveness, things like um, turnover. Um, and and if, you know, the more turnover you have in a school staff, uh, the the less well students do at the school. So looking at turnover, looking at attendance, perhaps um, if teachers aren't there for lengthy periods of time, it's it's hard to teach um, and to be effective. Um, and then um, we talked about the impact of experience and uh, teachers' uh, growth. Um, and effectiveness increases throughout their careers. It's really a, a myth um, that, that it only sharply rises in the first few years. It goes throughout the career, and there are certain factors that um, that uh, really uh, add to teachers' growth over time, and that's uh, increased collaboration in school sites. So we could um, be measuring through teacher surveys, perhaps, um, you know, the levels of collaboration in a school site that would also, you know, boost teachers' ability to be effective in their sites, um, and as well as teaching the same class or subject grade levels for multiple years in a row, again, also boosts effectiveness. Um, so I think we talked about being creative and the various data points we might use. Great, thank you. Um, group two. So in looking at the question, um, that's not our question. Um, how could a definition of ineffective feature facilitate cooperation? We need to go a step back. That definition of ineffective teacher needs to be a collective definition. And if you don't have teachers as part of that voice to come up with that definition, then you're never going to have cooperation. Um, actually, I think every single member here in this group had a, a great idea. Another one is if we, if we as a state have adopted our state standards and, if, and um, we hold ourselves accountable for that with our kids, can we also hold ourselves accountable for that for ourselves, but done it really in a collective way where the focus is how do we improve in our, in our um, implementation of the standards so that we're not singling people out. And Joanne, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're not, the focus isn't in, on labeling people, but on looking at, at a school level unit and understanding ourselves, how are we doing, what can we do better? Right, yeah. but it's based on 
based on some criteria that is actually identifiable and actionable to improve school performance. Um, so possibly tied to some of the dashboard indicators or in some way um, when we have a basis for legitimate cooperation that'll yield school performance and improvement. And, and that's consistent with the, my thought of, you know, just it's too easy to label people when you use the term ineffective. And if we instead think about what's most effective or um, and aim at that rather than, the other thing is uh, uh, Kimberly brought up a, a point that resonated with me, and supposing there was a system where we had four levels of performance, the top, you know, first, second, third, and the bottom of the fourth, and the fourth, if that, if we label that ineffective, we may move out, however ineffective is, de is defined, we may move out all the ineffective teachers from a given low-performing school and be left with a bunch of teachers at the level three, which will have a marginal impact, perhaps. But if we instead focus on making sure that we have a really good, strong, just distribution, an equitable distribution of our most effective teachers and, and the ones close to them, you know, that the top, say the top two, then we're really going to see changes because kids will have access to the very best that we have in the system and it'll, you know, to the extent that that's peer, peer determined and peer worked on and, and um, done as in a, in a very positive collaborative way, that could be effective and actually make a real difference in what happens educationally for the kids. Yes. Uh, but going back to the first question, I do want to highlight that part of the conversation about how limited we felt with the question was because it implied that, you know, respecting local agreements meant there was little hope for change. When if we're rethinking the whole system, we also want to rethink the practice as to how, you know, what are, again, without focusing on labeling people, but really looking at the practices and what, what's effective, what isn't. But, um, just highlighting that we see, we think is going to have the opposite effect because then you're empowering those people to not change and, and stay still when we want to open an opportunity to rethink models and practices and agreements, bargaining agreements as well. The question I have earlier, we were in the in the groups looking at subsections of the plan, and the one that touch briefly upon the, this term of ineffective teacher mentioned that there would be some sort of stakeholder groups that would meet to discuss this in detail. And I was just wondering, have those groups formed and who is a part of those groups? They have not yet. This Well, um, we've had many conversations um, with stakeholders. This is the, the first, this is the kickoff for the formal, um, this formal conversation of which there will be many more. Um, but yeah, this is the, this is the kickoff. So I guess my question is, will the statements of model practices as they're developing, would they in any way serve as a guideline for some criteria to use for effective practice? Great. So to honor the agenda, we're going to move it along and we're going to have to, we'll have to shorten the discussion on questions three and four, um, principles three and four, um, of which number three, this group's going to talk about avoiding the mislabeling of people and schools. And in order to avoid mislabeling, what should be part of the ineffective teacher definition and what should not be? And then for number four, ensuring equity of teaching, what should be part? and what should not. Um, and so I think we've gotten a lot of great ideas out on the table, hopefully to be able to continue the, that, that line of thinking that you've already started, thinking about it um, with these two frames. Um, and we'll just take um, about four or five minutes to discuss this, and then we'll do a final share out and, and finish up. So question three and question four? Yep. All right, let's bring it back together. Hopefully somebody will take the opportunity to summarize the conversation. And maybe we'll do a reverse order this way where we'll put number four on the spot and shift over to number three. What? You guys are four. What's that? Yeah. 
All right, so group four, we're gonna, we'll reverse it this time. We'll start with this side and bring it over to give you guys a little time to think time this time. Group four, conversation. So we still kind of were sticking with our positive view of the world, um, although we realized that we still then would have to come with criteria. But we were kind of uh, thinking that if you ask people whether it's a survey of other colleagues, it m probably would be easier to get people to say, yes, this is the band of teachers who are the most effective. And we weren't just trying to separate ineffective from effective and make it two bands, but maybe have it's a multi-band. And it seems that it would be as valid to say, do low-income students have access to the highest, highest, most effective teachers? And are those teachers distributed evenly around our, our districts? Um, as to say, are the least effective also distributed evenly? I mean, it seems like it's kind of two sides of the same thing. And it might be, from a collaboration standpoint, um, just easier to find a definition around most effective either. And so I think we could base it just on years of experience because it's research based and, and then it's not personal and it's easy to count, which some, at some point we have to look in the ease of use of this and is it actually gonna get done. The, the reaching out and, and having a survey of other colleagues at a school site and I think the other one was to use existing, the existing evaluation system. And while we may say that there are drawbacks in it, it's probably something that should be fixed. So maybe this helps us fix it because we're using it more robustly. Thank you. Group three. So our question was avoiding the mislabeling of people in schools. Um, again, as as with you know, question one, maybe all the questions, but you know, it is focused on how do we avoid, and you know, um, uh, it was said in our group that this the whole double negative conundrum is is uh, a difficult one in this. How do we avoid mislabeling people ineffective? Um, so just to answer that question on uh, you know at very at a, at a very base level I think one of the ways you do that is by what's already been said is relying on uh, evaluation but what comes with evaluation is um, appropriate training and equipping of those who do the evaluation to make sure it's calibrated local processes effective policies uh, and common language and understanding uh, about how that standard is met. However, um, the bigger question is one that everyone continues to surface today is how do we make sure that there's the broadest pool of effective teachers to be in front of our students who need it most? And I think it was Dr. Darling Hammond who coined the phrase, you know, there's no way to fire our way to Finland, uh, which is, you know, meaning that we, we can't just keep trying to chop off people we think aren't meeting the standard. We have to elevate um, those who are in the profession by giving uh, the appropriate training, the appropriate support uh, that is needed from the outset. And an example that is given from those who, and I please know that I really sometimes at this point get tired of hearing about Finland, <laughs> but it's what I've got. Um, <laughs> is that you know when there when the question is posed what do you do about ineffective teachers they're legitimately confused <laughs> by that question that given what we've invested in those who are in this profession given that we have policies in a system that set up people for success that's not a huge consideration of ours um, so I have to think that if we prioritize instead of how to avoid mislabeling people or um, how to figure out um, how we talk about collective bargaining agreements, um, uh, that 
if we're talking about how fundamentally we need to view this, percep this uh, profession, and those of us who've been in it know that sometimes it requires uh, you to dig deep, both in your pocket, in your uh, uh, support systems, to be successful as a practitioner in our particular system. Um, we need to facilitate the um, excellent training and support um, of our teachers in our system, and then we can look at that pool of teachers that we're saying we need you in front of uh, this particular group of students. I mean, part of what I want to uplift, you know, just from this principle, it, it's how I see it applied throughout the whole um, shift. And, and I, I think it's coming from a place of fear, but I think we're going from one extreme of being compliance driven, punitive, to now this, this other extreme of, you know, just so focused on strength and growth that we, because we're afraid of mislabeling, we are afraid of also setting higher, you know, goals and performances, which I think, you know, that if, if we're really doing the shift, we should hold ourselves to high standards. We should hold ourselves to, to proven practices so that, um, again, not to mislabel people, but, but what I'm afraid with all of this is that, you know, we are, we may be fostering this culture that, you know, any growth is positive, even if it's not moving our students along. And so I think this applies back, you know, to, to the whole movement, but also to this practice. So, get, uh, so I would also recommend looking at the, you know, teacher credentialing commission, because uh, to look at the learned practices or the lessons learned from all the discipline cases that they hear in order to identify, you know, what the, the what what are the, the stream cases that should be included here as part of this conversation, as well as, you know, to set that bar more clearly as to what we're not going to tolerate while we're working to identify all of the capacities and skills that teachers should have in order to be fully equipped to be in front. Uh, and effective in front of our students. I, I just wanted to make one final appeal um, for coherence again. And then I think if we've established some state priorities and some criteria that we say will drive the system for improvement, to the degree that we can be consistent in the use of those things whenever we're thinking about all aspects of the system, I think that keeps us working together. And, and so we aren't thinking about uh, defining effective teachers based on this set of criteria, continuous improvement based on this set of criteria, some th something else based on this set of criteria. But to the degree that these things work together, we may actually see and we probably will see improvement in the system. So I just make the argument one more time for us to think about somehow incorporating those things as our, in our definition of effective teaching. And um, I would just like to raise a question here. Um, it seems to me that what this item is asking is how do we, how do we develop a system that provides equitable access to um, really the strongest possible education that we can provide? And part of it is teacher, part of it is a whole, the principal, part of it is a whole host of other things. And so right here, they're talking just about the teacher. But what, what we haven't even addressed, and, and you know, Karen, when you start talking about Finland, I thought, aha, they pay a whole lot more for their teachers. Their teachers are required to get masters, they're, and they get paid for having masters. And the system is set up to both incentivize excellence in teaching and reward it. And maybe part of what we need to think about is, Instead of you know dealing with challenges like well my contract says uh, people get to move based on seniority or whatever, how do we incentivize people to want to work at the schools that are really more challenging, and how do we incentivize those teachers who are very effective, however it's defined, but what is what is our state doing to help us do that? Because right now what's going to it, it the system or the way I think it's being described it's going to fall on. And there are many good things that we've been talking about, ways to work with our, in our schools and our, in our districts to make sure that good, strong instruction is widely distributed. But I think we also can't count on all of us to have to think of how to do that individually. 
and the state has a role to help with that. And part of the role might be the the uh, the models of you know exemplary practice, that kind of thing. Part of the role is is supporting and providing lots of professional development. Part of the role might be helping you know providing extra opportunities for people to advance themselves on a career ladder or with extra pay or something to willingly embrace the, the situation, the opportunity to work in a school that has a lot of room for growth. Um, and, and so that to maybe help us think beyond just, you know, beyond just an evaluation or beyond just a, you know, are we gonna move people here or there, but what are we gonna do to grow capacity, to, to recognize capacity, and to help people who have great capacity to, to uh, think about contributing that capacity to schools that, that ha are in need of that. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for it. This is a tough topic to tackle, not just because you're practitioners, but because this is a conversation that can have some far-reaching impact on practices at your school and will inform a lot of decisions about activities for professional support and so on at your school. I appreciate Chair Ishkin's assertion about the importance of coherence because from the beginning um, the goal of the board has been to try to articulate a single coherent system that artic that blends the complexities of what is being implemented with the LCAP and the mandates and flexibility for federal accountability and so the it, the emphasis on coherence becomes important but we can't have a conversation on teacher quality and coherence in the same sentence without recognizing there are already some documents that exist that address this particular issue. And so I was surprised that this was not developed or considered as part of the conversation for you today. First of all, as part of the state plan, some of this work is supposed to be addressed in what is entitled to of the state plan and what is being done to provide support for districts using those Title II funds. And so while that may be a separate conversation, it is still important that the funding for different types of priorities and programs that are considered allowable expenditures for Title II funds to support this work should have also been a consideration placed in front of this group because these are the things the board is going to be tasked to look at in July and, and consider based on the public feedback and in some way app approve this at the September meeting. There's also, when you start looking at what's in the state plan, we have a couple of other documents that deal with this, including a state educator effectiveness plan that's a holdover from No Child Left Behind, as well as the mandated plan the state had to consider on a teacher distribution plan that was never approved. So there are some policies and practices that have been in place in this state that should have been weighed or considered about what worked in LEAs and what didn't work that could have contributed to this conversation because again, that goes along with coherence. Failing to take a look at the lessons learned from the iteration of No Child Left Behind and highly qualified teacher, and then the work that was done to craft a teacher distribution plan and look at educator effectiveness in a draft plan, lessons should have been considered or reviewed about what we understand and what we learn about uh, teacher quality and about dealing with the teacher distribution issues. Um, the third point, and I appreciate that the staff attempted to do this in talking about the California way, and I saw, the, I saw you all uh, struggling with this, is to clearly articulate as it relates to the issues of evaluation and bargaining, you know, what is the scope of bargaining or what are the unique issues related to the scope of bargaining that have an impact on this conversation. 
So I congratulate the panel for trying to step around that by suggesting we should use existing evaluation systems, recognizing that there's a local context to how, because of the scope of bargaining, many local evaluation practices help to thread out or tease out some of the elements of this conversation. And so you are struggling in a vacuum with a lot of, with a lot of policy ideas that really the state has some existing practice and some information on what has done well, what has actually contributed to this concept of the California way that probably needed to be presented to you so that it be considered fully and fully vetted. Um, going forward, as these other groups start having these conversations, I would suspect it would be helpful for those groups to be informed about those other practices and what those key learnings are, primarily because this group in opening that conversation today as the group that's advisory to the board, listening to their struggles and listening to how well-rounded and how well thought out their ideas were anyway, I think it would be helpful to make sure that we're informed not only by what current practice is, but what we have learned from those current practices. And finally, and probably most importantly, and this is just going back to the idea about uh, coherence, we have terms of art that's in the existing educator equity plan that are a little bit different. The third term in the current e educator equity plan is not ineffective teacher, but unqualified teacher. So when we look at the existing state documents and draft plans, concerning teacher quality and teacher distribution, there is a need to make sure that we're not conflating terms. And I heard that very clearly from a couple of um, members on the panel who would rather make sure we're talking about what is effective teaching so that we're not lo lo lowering it down to a single number or a term of service so that we're not touching on or overlapping into what is unqualified or what is uh, ineffective. And so I think that there is a need to make sure that we're clear on the terms of art that are falling under this umbrella term of ineffective teacher because there is kind of a conflating of those ideas about the term of service, about the type of certification, about the assignment, about the difference between the assignment and the type of certification, and about performance. And so all of those different terms and ideas need to be clarified to make sure that whatever statement is finally written into the document first has coherence, and then that statement informs what is done in those Title II plans. Thank you for that feedback. And thank you all for the feedback as well. Um, so any other questions or comments before we um, start to wrap up? No, we just want to encourage folks that um, through the um, the feedback uh, gathering process that um, Barb Burchison laid out earlier, we encourage people as you continue to think about this, if you have ideas, we are looking for that feedback in ongoing ways. And um, you see the link here on how you can go about doing that. Uh, but we just want to thank you for the, for the input, for the feedback um, um, all across the board. So thank you very much. Thanks for the challenging discussion. We needed to wake up after lunch. I think that did it. All right, um, we'll open it up for public comment. Yes, Madam Chair, we have one person signed up for public comment, Liz Guillen from Public Advocates. Hello, uh, Liz Guillen again with Public Advocates. Um, I was really surprised to see the frame of uh, the approach to defining uh, the terms that ESSA requires. Um, I just want to point out that in the current California law, LCFF, um, there's a section that says how the LCAP is supposed to describe specific actions. Uh, and then there's one little sentence at the end that says, the specific actions shall not supersede the provisions of existing local collective bargaining agreements within the jurisdiction of the school district. Um, and the word existing local collective bargaining agreements was really important for organizations like public advocates and parents, students, and communities because it did allow for hope 
that they could make changes and that because things might be in current agreements didn't mean that they were going to be there forever, that there could be potential to work things out or to come to a different understanding and agreement. We think that the state should uh, take the time in, and include in the ESSA plan a definition of ineffective and we think that it should deliberately and directly take up the issue of, of uh, replacing the STAL Act. Um, we think that teacher evaluation should be based on multiple measures of effectiveness and that it should be linked to individual professional growth opportunities to strengthen them. Out of field teachers, uh, we think that it should include the misassigned teachers in the out of field teacher category. Misassignment is one of the uh, points that needs to be part of the LCAP state priority number one. We want all teachers to be in the classrooms that they're prepared to teach in. And that inexperienced teacher she should be a teacher that has two or fewer years of teaching experience. Thank you, Ms. Keene. That is time. Thank you. You have a hard job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, we have one more agenda item, and that is the update on the school conditions and climate work groups and the family engagement work groups. Good afternoon, and thank you all again for just engaging with us today. I'm, I continue to be in awe of this group. So good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, CPAG members, Chief Deputy Price. My name is Jacqueline Allison, and I'm going to be presenting today an update on the work of the School Conditions and Climate Work Group with... Hi, I'm Ronnie Jones with Wested and the Comprehensive Center. So I just want to note that um, really today as we're talking, um, I want to acknowledge that we've been before you several times. So there's qu quite a few things that we've already talked about. And so what we're going to be sharing with you today are the emerging ideas and recommendations that the work group has been considering. Um, we really need your feedback on this because it's quite substantial. Okay, so with that um, on the screen, you can see the scope of the work group. I just wanted to update you on a couple of things. They've been meeting since September 2016, and they've been continued to meet monthly ever since. And um, recently, we just had a webinar on May 12th, and the archived webinar is up on the LCFF channel at WestEd, lcff.wested.org, and you can go there to see some of the other feedback and comments on some of the same content that we're gonna be presenting to you today. So in the interest of time, I'm just gonna kind of dive right in, if that's okay with you. So central to the work of the work group is the development of a recommendation framework that clearly outlines the importance of positive school conditions and climate in a student's academic success. Um, the working framework elements include uh, the development of recommendations and corresponding action plans for focusing on validity and reliability, data, meaning, and use, um, including scale, modalities, continuous improvement, and timeline phrasing. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about what each of those things mean. But what I wanna focus you here is on these central questions that have been emerging as topics of discussion. The first question again is how do we define school conditions and climate? We brought that before you last time and I just wanted to point out that we did incorporate your feedback as well as other stakeholder feedbacks to come up with this version that you see here. This is um, part of it, and then um, we added in, in particular, an equity lens, the validity lens, and the family engagement lens to really call that out in the context of school conditions and climate. So this is something that's new. 
and that will continue to be built out as we continue to have more stakeholder engagement sessions. But right now, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the next question, which is how do we ensure the validity and reliability of California's work in school conditions and climate? Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for staying with us um, mentally and physically this afternoon. Um, the, uh, the School Conditions and Climate Work Group has spent quite a bit of time talking about validity and reliability. It was a topic that we brought to you last time, and the work group continued to work on this um, topic. And so we want to bring some things back to you that the work group has been thinking about that will be woven into their recommendations. Um, so if you have comments as we go through this section, please feel free to um, stop. I'll pause and um, ask for comments as we go. We don't necessarily have a specific question around this section, but we'd be interested in, in your feedback overall about uh, the direction that the work group is going with this. So one of the things um, that you should know about the work group when it comes to uh, validity and reliability, and you will see some of your comments previously um, reflected in the ideas that we have here, um, is about the collection, interpretation, and use of school conditions and climate data. And so uh, the school conditions and climate um, work group is really um, invested in the promotion and development sorry, to promote the development and implementation of data collection tools that are appropriate to local contexts and settings. As you know, school climate is the only um, indicator that actually is collecting data in two ways, both as a state indicator as well as a local indicator. So the um, school um, suspension rates are part of the um, state data collection and is reflected on the dashboard. And then the local indicator is is any sort of valid tool that a school district chooses to use. Um, but the School Conditions and Climate Work Group has talked a lot about the fact that there are tools that might be more appropriate in some contexts than in other contexts. Um, additionally, um, you actually brought to our attention, as well as the work group, really thinking through the building of capacity of LEA staff to interpret that data and construct meaning um, from that data as well. Um, and then also to have an informed um, decision making and implementation strategies that align with the appropriate use of data. I think last time we had several conversations around, well, what if data is collected but then maybe used to make decisions that it was never intended to um, be used to make? And so that creates a problem. Um, to maintain the privacy um, of this data, so making sure that, that we don't associate data with um, any particular student, and then also to incorporate the perspective of multiple stakeholders and ensure that the strategies um, address all student groups. So one of the things that the work group is thinking about making a recommendation in order to provide support in all of these areas is to um, have the state really start thinking about a clearinghouse. And within this clearinghouse, being able to provide a variety of resources to build capacity, to provide support, to um, ensure that school districts can talk to each other. Similar school districts may be similar in demographics, but also school districts that maybe are having similar issues or problems, and they might be able to find each other um, either through a clearinghouse or find resources that they are able to access in order to support their own development as they start thinking about school conditions and climate. The work group um, really would like to see school con the importance of school conditions and climate elevated to the same level um, as the academic standards. They believe that by improving school conditions and climate, there will then be um, a, an increase in academic achievement at the sites that see that improvement. So I'm just going to pause for a second and, and see a second and see if you have any feedback or any comments. I saw some people writing things down. I don't know if those were questions. All right, let me just check my notes. All right. Um, a couple other things. Um, I think one of my bullet points got um, backwards, confused on this slide. Um, and so there are two common sources that the School Conditions and Climate Work Group is looking at um, in order to sort of guide um, their decision making and their recommendations. Um, around um, validity, validity and reliability. And so one of those is the professional testing standards and the other is the educational assessment research um, from NRC. And so 
uh, you'll notice that both of, the, both of those have to do with testing. And so the School Conditions and Climate Work Group is really working hard to take what they need around testing, but also understand that there needs to be flexibility around a local context. Um, and so a couple of things is that um, in order um, to present a standard for validity and reliability um, that's typically applied in the context of high stakes and educational testing isn't necessarily the direction they want to go in, but they're using those as guiding principles. And so what they want to do is they want to emphasize the selection of the single most valid um, measure in order to construct um, in order to construct uh, and maximize um, the predictive utility of that tool, right? So it's sort of a technical term, but they want the tool to be as useful to them as possible while still holding to a high standard of validity and reliability. They understand there's a trade-off sometimes that if a tool is more useful, then sometimes it might not be quite as valid, but if it's more valid, sometimes it's not as useful. And so they're trying to strike a balance between those two things. Um, and then one of the things that we've heard from stakeholders again and again is to reduce redundancy. <laughs> Um, and so we don't want students or parents or educators to be surveyed to death. We want to make sure that the surveys that we're using are useful across multiple areas in order for them um, to sort of have the, the most bang for their buck that they can get out of surveys. Questions, comments? Okay. Thank you, Ronnie. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to focus in on questions three and four. So how should California best measure school conditions and climate? What you see before you is a graphic organizer. This is in draft form, but this is something that the work group came up with. And it basically summarizes their initial recommendations that um, it generate, it represents the substantive agreements reached regarding school conditions and climate. And so each of these could potentially become the basis for a set of recommendations from the state superintendent and the CDE to the State Board of Education for decision making around LCFF priority six. Now we're gonna walk you through each element. And so let's start again with question three. How should California best measure school conditions and climate? So what I wanna emphasize here with this graphic is essentially that um, we talked earlier about this clearinghouse that would vet a certain amount of surveys, right? So LEAs would select from a vetted list of surveys, vetted through the clearinghouse referred to earlier, and then administer that survey to not only students, but students, parents, and staff. And then after they administer that survey, they would conduct an additional qualitative method to deepen understanding of those survey results. And they're asking that whatever survey is used, that it has to measure at least a minimum school connectedness, sense of safety, and school conditions. So when you think about that, let me just kind of go through that one more time. They're gonna take, they're gonna give a survey to students, staff, parents, okay? That has been vetted through a clearinghouse. And then once they get the results, they're gonna conduct another qualitative method to deepen the understanding of those survey results. We have one member on our, uh, the work group who's a principal, and essentially what he's looking for <laughs> is data that actually is usable, that will help him make a difference at a school site. So if the survey results show that my students are afraid to go to the bathroom, I wouldn't be able to you know, check in and say, what is going on? So that I can actually assess my school climate and then make a real difference. And so they're hoping that with this type of recommendation that it would get at that need. Yes. I just wanna clarify on what you're saying. Are you saying that school districts would have to um, use a vetted and reliable on this master list so they couldn't use one they're already using and the second question is, who, who or what would be the process for the vetted clearinghouse? I do know some school districts who've been using um, well-developed surveys over time, and I'm just what I'm hearing you say is they, they only can choose for, under this recommendation from a vetted list, and I'm just curious, who is the vetted, who vets it, what's the list, and how does the district clarify, okay? Those are great questions. And if I, I can call your attention here to the slide, um, one thing I didn't mention that I should have 
mentioned because this is very key, is that we they do recognize that districts are already using surveys that really work well for their local needs. And so there would be an option to use an alternative survey that works for you, right? And they were talking about this idea of, well, if they wanted to use something else that's not from a vetted list, that would be vetted based on that clearinghouse idea. You know, there would be a clearinghouse to say, these are the top five surveys that have been vetted for validity and reliability, and we think as a state that these really capture the essence of school conditions and climate around those measures. Once, if they already have something that's working for them, they can opt out. They don't have to choose those. And who's the vetted clearing structure? Is it this working commission committee that is the vetting group? I think that's still the, an idea that's under discussion and under construction. Yeah. The other thing I want to say is that throughout all of our stakeholder input mm -hmm. sessions that we've had, we actually have had requests from superintendents and from principals, can you help us find surveys that, that are val valid and reliable? So that's been a request again and again, particularly from small to small to medium school districts, that they really feel like they need some help um, in finding those surveys. So I think that was part of the basis of that recommendation. Mm -hmm. But yes, but the particulars around that, I don't, they haven't yeah. fleshed that out. Um, and Yes. There, there are technical measures for surveys in terms of, of that you would use for vetting, you know, the way questions are formed or not formed, and if they're leading or not leading, if they're, you know, phrased correctly, if they're covering the construct that you're looking for without being um, uh, misleading or et cetera. But another aspect to whether surveys are really valid is who's being surveyed and is that group representative of, say, all the different groups that you have in your district, as well as the sample size. And those are things that um, nobody knows what the results are going to be until they're actually used. And it would be dependent on each district to use it in a way that um, follows certain guidelines of, of how to survey appropriately. Okay, thank you for that. Are there any other comments about this particular question or section? Okay, so we're going to move on to question four now. All right, it's late in the day. Okay, um, <laughs> so uh, the next question that the, um, the uh, work group has been tackling is how should California best include the measurement of, school, uh, measurement of school conditions and climate in its accountability system? As you know, school our school climate right now um, is measured as a, lo as a local indicator, and that local indicator report is currently an open-ended text box. So the, the standard for that says that schools must use a valid survey with students and report that data out. And that's really the only guidance that districts have at this moment. And I'm sorry, that data is reported at a district level. But the School Conditions and Climate Work Group has really been wrestling with questions about how to do a better job of reporting that data um, because they, they aren't sure that there's enough guidance or support provided to districts with just that simple framing. Um, and I think that, that the board has asked for input from the Conditions and Climate Work Group um, for the same reason, that there has to be more than just that simple statement of um, a valid measure um, given to students. So I think that's that's one of the things. And so some of the things that the, the work group is considering, none of these things are, um, they haven't landed on anything yet, but these are the ideas that they're talking about, is that um, is there a way to report the results via the dashboard knowing that that's only an entry point. So with any of the local indicator, any of the indicators actually, you all know that having a red color or having a met not met is just the beginning of an investigation around that particular indicator. And so at what level can the data be reported that helps the public and parents and students and teachers and even school boards to understand that this is just an entry level point for the data and that, that, that there may need to be a deeper dive around that data. Also determining how best to support LEAs through resources of a clearinghouse. We know that school districts really want climate to get better. Teachers want a great place to work. Students want a great school to go to. Um, and parents want a great place for, to send their kids every day. And so what are some resources for all of those groups to be able to make their school a better place and to understand how school climate can impact um, things like attendance, suspension rates, and all of the other indicators um, that are on the dashboard. 
Um, how to support LEAs to create their own benchmarks. So this again comes down to one of the things within the, in the dashboard that we know. We know that every year students in third through eighth grade take the CASP test, but they also have a series of benchmark assessments that they implement at their school site level to understand progress along the way. And so how can districts utilize um, some tools or even the survey or parts of the survey to help them benchmark progress throughout the year so that when they are reporting this data, they know that they've made progress before that final upload date comes for the dashboard. And then finally, um, the, the work group has really been trying to think through how can, bench, how can the data be benchmarked both as growth and status or progress and status or status and change, whatever you want to call it, so that districts understand the patterns and trends over the last several years with school climate and at the same time understand where they are at this moment. Um, it, they know that doing a five by five isn't necessarily the answer, but what they want to do is they want to give school districts credit for where they are now and the progress that they've made maybe over the last several years when it comes to school climate, because they think that's an important factor. Is that good? Okay. <laughs> that's great. Thank you, Rennie. Oh, well, sorry, my next. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry, y'all, it's late. I <laughs> All right, so then we have um, a final question around um, how could California best support continuous improvement um, in school conditions and climate? And so again, these are just emerging ideas with the group, but they really have been talking through how to provide guidance, maybe via a website or via other support providers. How could county offices become involved in this system? What are the areas of support that already exist that, um, that could also um, continue to provide support around um, conditions and climate? What are the exemplars? What are some best practices that, that districts are engaging in so that other districts can learn from them? And I think you all talked about cohorting, right? How do you sort of bring districts together to have conversations, to have professional learning networks around these things? Um, to integrate this into um, a system of support, as I said, and then to disseminate materials and resources. So we all know that, that schools are very focused on academic success. It's, it's, the, um, it's really the outcome of so many years of no child left behind. So how do we get them to also consider school um, conditions and climate and actually take those materials seriously and really begin to dive into them um, and understand how important school conditions and climate um, are to the achievement of their students. Okay. And so with that, so to check here, just um, with that, some of the, I just wanna take a quick moment to just recap, essentially, We've talked about a validity and reliability clearinghouse. You know, vetting a few amount of surveys that LEAs can choose from. If they have something that already works for them, then they could select that as well. They could be their alternative option. Once the survey is administered, it's not just administered to students like Ronnie was calling out, but also teachers and also parents and other staff members. And then after that, the idea of ensuring that once you get your data results, you do something else to deepen your understanding of that to really help you assess your school climate and the school conditions for improvement. So with that, some of the remaining questions that are under consideration by the work group, um, again, include how do, we, how do we report this data? Does the data need to be disaggregated? What about response rates? So kind of speaking to what you were talking about with the technical aspects of surveys and the results. Um, how can the recommendations remain comprehensive for the purposes of conditions and of the school conditions and climate indicator yet be aligned with other local indicator measurements? I mean, there are surveys that you have to complete for other <laughs> local indicators. We don't want to bring something forward that is causing more work and that's not aligned with already what is already existing. Um, we want to think about what is it really reasonable for a district and schools to implement regarding an additional qualitative method? Like what does that really mean? And what would that look like on the ground? Um, and then what is it reasonable for districts and schools to report annually? They want the survey to be done annually. Right now it's every other year. So what's reasonable around that? 
And then should qualitative data be reported at the school site level? You know, again, these are different types of questions. And maybe you, as you're looking at these, you're thinking you're missing some. There are some other questions that you, we need to talk about. Um, and then I guess at the, at the end, I want to make sure, because we're talking about here making a change to our system here, how can the state best support LEAs with ongoing continuous quality improvement and integration with the LCAP process, especially around school conditions and climate? You know, I know that's a lot to grapple with. So with that, we're going to do yeah. some reflecting now. Yeah, so we would like any of your thoughts around any of those questions that we just asked when it comes to disaggregation, school site level data, anything like that that you feel like you would like to share with us. I'll go back to those other questions um, so that maybe you can take a look at them about how the data should be reported out, about what you've been hearing from school sites, about what they would like to know about their school climate, anything like that that maybe you um, could share with us. And I just want to also add, and any thoughts on the new idea around the vetted surveys and any other ideas about that as well? Yeah. I, I don't, I'll open. Um, I think the, the work's very, very significant and impressive. And the idea about the clearinghouse, about the vetting of particular instruments, about follow up with qualitative interviews. All of it is positive, great. And I do think there's tremendous interest in school climate and that people understanding the connection between climate and academic achievement, climate as a leading indicator is very important. All of that being said, I'm not sure how I feel about it being on the dashboard as a state indicator. And I go back to what I think was our initial conversation about the indicators that would be on the dashboard and the test that an indicator had to meet to be on the dashboard, that it was information that was already collected, that it was it it met, met certain criteria. So given, at least in my experience, what have always been problems with survey administration, and I think Linda pointed to the idea of sample size numbers, and it, it makes me a bit nervous to think about this on the dashboard. Yeah, so let me just be clear that the, at this point, the work group is not making a recommendation that this become a state indicator. It would still be a local indicator, but there would be a frame built in to sort of elevate the level of quality around the indicator rather than an open-ended text box. So I apologize if that if that didn't come through. So just to clarify. Thank you. I okay. feel better. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> Member Keene? Sorry. Okay. So... I'm not sure about annual. While I think having the data would be wonderful annually, I just, and I think you need, you need to hear from school sites and because to, to survey all of your staff and all of your, and I know it's students at certain grade levels, but still it's, it's a relatively large group. So kind of piggybacking on the, do an, a survey, the big survey, do the, the secondary kind of qualitative diving deeper I wonder then if in the off year something can be developed that is a mini where maybe you sample some schools or something that's smaller but still helps you measure progress and growth so that you're not saying, well, I have no idea and I guess we'll just wait for two whole years and find out if we made progress, but something that's slightly smaller than the whole big thing every year. Right. And I do just want to say that one of the things that we're doing is we're currently working with AXA to put together um, a site principal feedback session so that we can actually get some direct feedback from principals because we know <laughs> we know that, that this sort of wreaks havoc with them. And so we're trying to get some feedback from them as well. So, Member Monroe? So a couple things. I would just like to uh, echo uh, Chair Iskin's uh, appreciation for this work. I think it's um, wholly important and and perhaps has fewer 
I don't know, per parameters on it or is, is less grounded in anything. So it's, it's a new territory and I think it's worth persevering. I actually like that it's on the dashboard and I like the way that it's on the dashboard, that it's clear or proposed to be on the dashboard, <laughs> that it's clear that it is a local indicator, but that it allows a community member, a parent, whomever to go to that same place and get that uh, information. The other thing I'm curious about is, so uh, at the Alameda County Office of Education, for many years, uh, we have had the California Healthy Kids uh, program and so have had a large library, a resource library and a resource librarian. I know the lift that is. So I, when I hear, you know, we could have a clearinghouse, I'm just thinking, who's doing that? And, you know, what's the plan for that? Um, so just, you know, sharing anxiety is all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. No. We're about anxiety. to ship that all yeah. back <laughs> to all whomever anxiety. will receive it because we're, we're getting out of the business. But um, uh, at any rate, the, the other thing is I, I think a goal, an aspirational goal for us would be to uh, eventually look at correlating the trends on the other indicators, so the state indicators with the trends on uh, this particular local indicator, as we know that school climate and culture uh, actually has a direct correlation to uh, academic achievement. Don't quite know how that'd be done if people are using different measures, but I think districts could figure that out for their context and it's something that they could be challenged to report onto their community um, that for these uh, uh, priorities that we've set forth perhaps in the LCAP, here is what the, the corollary benefit we're seeing on the indicators um, at the state level. And then the other thing that's extremely, uh, the last thing is uh, um, when you do establish the clearinghouse, uh, <laughs> to have uh, um, videos and resources of exemplars. Um, because if you are far from understanding and, and being able to implement uh, effective strategies for um, school climate and culture, you actually need to see and hear and feel what that looks like, um, you know, even more than getting a, a, a great survey or something like that. And you have to be, um, see the compelling change that makes, how, how palpable it is when you walk into schools that have strong culture. Great, thank you. Thank you also for the, the work that's gone into it. And one of the things that I think I see in the flow chart is really a desire on the part of the group, that work group, to make sure that people use the survey results and um, use them to improve situations for students. And that's commendable. Um, I, I'm not sure that I would necessarily think that, um, you know, do I want to count, did every principal have a, a survey a focus group meeting with people? and it, it'll begin to, to devolve into a checklist of did we do this, that, and the other thing. And what I really want, and I think what they want too, is that information be gathered that's important and that is useful and that changes things for kids. And I was thinking, I think there's a little bit of a tension. Um, we, we also do the Healthy Kids Survey every other year. And I could give you numbers that would be, you know, very, very positive on almost all indicators. We had one one piece of a survey was just a couple questions that came out and raised a concern in my in my perspective. So overall, the survey results were fantastic, but I saw one question that indicated some kids were concerned about something and that it was across a number of high schools. That's what I took from that survey. I didn't worry about all the other things because, you know, they were pretty good as it is. And, and if on my, if I had a dashboard thing, it, it would end up saying, you know, the survey results were good. It was one question. So it was never aggregated to the point where um, it would it would make a difference in any of the results that were reported. But it was important for us as a district to deal with that question and the answers that we were getting from it so that we could address the situation that it was it was in relationship to. Um, and so I think we have to be really thoughtful and mindful that if there are different surveys, there's different ways the information is gathered and reported. And even that might not be the best um, outcome for a given district to report. It wouldn't do me any good to say, okay, again, every year, I have 97% of the parents are satisfied, 95% of the kids, blah, blah, blah. 
and next year it was 95 again or 96, and it's you know marginally different, but it's all very high. What I really cared about was there was this one question that didn't come out in a way that I thought we should have and that we should address that. And somehow or other, I think we have to give districts the flexibility to deal with what they think is important from the survey results. Otherwise, I could have focus meetings on my total results and it would be a waste of time. I, what I need to have is the opportunity to do what I need to do and to talk with people who can make the difference in what we can do. And so, for example, in ours, one of the things we did is we hired some extra counselors. Um, now, that didn't take, it didn't take a um, focus group to tell us to do that. That was something that, you know, in discussing the results, particularly in this case with, with high school principals and leadership, we could realize the kids needed access to more counseling. And it wasn't just academic counseling, it was uh, emotional counseling or, you know, typical, I don't, I don't know what you call it, but, you know, cl like clinical counseling. So how do we make that available for kids? Um, and um, so just to keep thinking, I think their intent is really very, very good, but I think it's, it's sometimes it's dangerous if we come up with a plan and assume it's gonna work in all contexts because usually context, you know, the variety exceeds what we can imagine. Yeah, and I think your use of the word tension, like that idea of creative tension between the way that you want things to be and then sort of the reality of what it is, right? And so I think that, mm -hmm. that you've all sort of spoken to this, that it would be really great to have, you know, these processes just ingrained in everybody, but what are the supports we can put in place to help people get there if they're not quite there yet? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah I, um, I know we're almost at time. I think the, the flow chart is great and the um, recommendations, I, I'm just really impressed uh, like others are. Um, I guess from a parent's perspective, wanted to echo the importance of um, surveying staff and parents in addition to students. I think, um, and I don't know if this is implied in what you said, that the um, while they all might measure the same constructs, the questions to get at that would be a little different for, for those audiences. Um, I guess I, I think if we can do it annually, that'd be great. Obviously, we've got to hear from site administrators, but schools change so much year to year. And um, and just think uh, this is really important data that speaks to how do you improve schools and if we can get access to that data every year and validate it with a qualitative measure. And um, I think, Linda, your example is really powerful. Also, the example you gave from the principal on the work group, you mm -hmm. know, he had to go deeper mm -hmm. and maybe that's a best practice, but um, you know, maybe you just dig into a few questions that you're choosing to dig into, but something that allows you to dig deeper into the results. Um, and then I'd echo support for the idea of making the um, survey results available through the dashboard, through some sort of click through. It's hard to know what we're talking about because we haven't seen what the narrative really looks like from folks, but I think the um, wide variety there might be too wide and to allow people to get to the actual raw data and make that you know, um, available in a user-friendly form would be um, very valuable to parents and community members. Great, thank you. If I can just follow up with a, a, a kind of unintended consequence that, that, I, that I would worry about, is that, so I gave you an example of a question that, that you know, raised a, you know, a level of concern in my mind, and we addressed it by providing some more clinical counseling, make that available. I can easily imagine that the following year, the need for clinical counseling will go up if people like it and say, oh yeah, yeah, you know what, I want that too. And so it'll look like we made no progress. But, um, you know, so just, just the, the kinds of things that can happen. Think through those. Yeah. Okay. We didn't know we needed it until it was available. Available. <laughs> oh my goodness, I need it too. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you so much. That was just absolutely fantastic, yeah. that feedback. Um, and I really appreciate this idea of yes, we need more, but also to remember that local customization needs are important. And so don't forget that and kind of navigating that tension. I think that's really powerful. Are there other comments? Okay. So there was some information here about the ad hoc family engagement work group. I just want to say that we are in the beginning stages. Um, we're going to be convening them again on Monday. And then once we convene them there, we'll have a little bit more content that we will present to you in a memo. Okay? So with that. Thank you. Yes, right. there are two public comments. Okay. Liz, Liz 
Guillen and Martha Alvarez. Thank you. Um, Liz Guillen with Public Advocates. I just wanted to add my voice uh, to some of the recommendations by the work group. Um, but before that, to thank the uh, department uh, for convening it and um, for um, really hearing the voices of students, parents, and community uh, about how important school climate is and that it needed to be measured. Um, I want to add my voice to the recommendations of the group around parents and teachers being surveyed and that there be another qualitative method to measure and that the, we make sure that the measurements or the surveys really actually measure connectedness, safety, and school conditions. Um, I also wanted to address the ideas around uh, including um, it, the measurement in our accountability <laughs> system. Um, I think the data should be disaggregated uh, by subgroup and school site if it is reliable, that is, and, and valid, and that there needs to be a better way for community uh, friendly reporting so that they understand um, how they are faring and what they can do about it. Um, in addition, there needs to be some way to benchmark um, what their scores are to know if they are improving and uh, again, what they can do about it. Um, the last thing is how can the state best support LEAs with ongoing continuous quality improvement uh, and integration with the LCAP process? We have been saying this for some time, and we think the state needs to fund it. We think that districts are really struggling with their limited uh, LCFF resources, uh, and that uh, those districts that have not already been surveying or measuring school climate really need uh, resources beyond uh, just the actual tool. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Martha Albers, on behalf of AXA. Um, so there's a couple of points I wanted to make. Um, first, there, it, it appears that there's some disconnect between the recommendations um, that the working group has been uh, made today um, and the comments made for the State Board of Education members at the meeting in May. Uh, at least Board Member Burr indicated that there was no interest at this point in time in this becoming a state indicator. And it's helpful the staff clarified that this would remain a local indicator. But I think it's important um, because there's this new flow chart that we had not seen before that would provide more clarity about what this would look like in implementation, that it's clear that as this um, a proposed plan, that, that it would not be a cookie cutter or a standardized process for all schools to uh, have to comply with in, in the future. As it was pointed by some of the um, superintendents in the room, uh, Linda Kaminsky in particular, um, this has to keep in mind the context at, at the local level by school districts, the capacity of school districts to be able to do a survey. Um, it would be difficult to expect districts to do a survey on an annual basis, and that would move away from the current practice of doing surveys on, on an every other basis. Um, I concur with the comments made um, that the small districts, um, principals have talked about the need to have some uh, potential vetted resources, some um, tools for them to use. That does not mean it has to become a standardized statewide um, tool for districts to be uh, required to do. And that brings me to my point to, uh, to Glenn Price, that to the extent possible that any of these resources could become part of the statement of model practices, that might be something that could be considered but it doesn't need to, does not need to mean we have to standardize it for every single school district. So being able to distinguish uh, a good resource available for whoever wants to use them versus making it an unfunded mandate. And then lastly, keeping in mind that this information is only one of eight state priorities. And so the expectation that district administrators will have the capacity to do everything here is uh, sort of in a vacuum, not keeping in mind everything else in the dashboard. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so since we are, are small, uh, we, we actually can't take any action today, so I'm skipping to opening up. Any final comments from CPAG members? Can I can make one, one comment. I really wanna go back to what Kimberly was saying and the, the question of a, an every other year with perhaps something in the middle that makes sense to you. So for example, that I was giving, I can imagine a situation where Okay, so I, I have a question that some kids are indicating they would like some counseling available. So the next year I checked to see, A, was more counseling available? Did kids take advantage of it? Um, what was the kids' perception on it? Um, what do parents think about it? 
What does staff think about it? Rather than another full-blown essay, I, I really focus on what the need was and try to determine. And I actually, I can even imagine I might need to do that for a while. Um, but it'll help me as a, as a school district, helps me know if what we're doing is being effective with the kids. And I might, I might not be able to get that information if I had to do you know, some large survey every single year. Okay. Any, any general public comment? All right, then I guess Board Member Strauss. So I just want to personally thank everyone for this work session and just let you know that we will really be guiding the whole board to look at the comments and both Member Rucker and I will be guiding our experience today with helping to focus the board on where we want to go with the next steps. So I just want to thank everybody, especially this time of year. I mean, it's always busy, but this is about as busy as you get when it's graduation week this week and next week. So just thank you very much. And I'm going to officially close the State Board of Education study session. Thank you. And on my part, thank you very much, everyone, for hanging until the bitter end. And we'll officially close our meeting as well. <laughs>